Good evening, everyone. I believe, if I have uh, rotated the PDF correctly, that we should be at this moment live ish. <laughs> Just waiting for chat to react to me. Yep, that looks like I'm alive. Fair enough. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Well, people have been asking for it, so uh, I thought we should have a little chat before Act 3 finally airs in about, what, uh, 12 hours or so? 12, 11, something like that? Some hours. Some number of hours before which I'm hoping to both finish a video and get some sleep. So, you know, <laughs> busy night. Anyway, um, this is going to be a fairly chill discussion stream. Um, I wanted to have more prepared, like I wanted to have like like analysis paper and stuff like that prepared for it, but I have been so monstrously swamped with work <laughs> this past week from the fucking Ruined King game releasing, and I've got some well some stuff that you'll see um, if you follow uh, Riot Forge on Twitter um, in an undetermined number of days. Um, and a bunch of other stuff that uh, that I've been working on. So this is just going to be a chill discussion stream. Um, where we'll talk about the season that has been so far, Act 1 and Act 2. We'll talk about the characters. We'll talk about some of the stuff I've noticed in terms of the storytelling. Uh, we'll talk about themes. We'll talk about all that good stuff. Um, and I'll take uh, questions from the audience also. Uh, to sort of help... You guys can help me lead the discussion, essentially. So how's the music? Is the music about right? Music is about right. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Was I able to get permission? Yes. This footage that you're looking at right now, this is a series of clips that Netflix specifically released from copyright for use in content. So like, these are completely fine. I'm... I, Theoretically, at least, I should not get any copyright claims uh, for these ones. So that's all good. Um, and I've also got I've also got some slideshows of, of screenshots and images taken from the show as well. It's mostly just background stuff while we talk. Um, but yeah, how's everybody doing tonight? Like uh, when I do my streams, I like to start them by just kind of hanging out and shooting the shit for a bit. Uh, just chatting because, well, that gives people time to see the notification and realize that the stream is live and, you know, get to be here from the beginning. YouTube is, like, notoriously bad with notifications. Like, I've had people come in at the end of a six-hour stream and go, oh, I only just got the notification. So, you know. How long is the stream going to be? That's a good question, Mamat. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want it to go much over three hours. Um, which I hope it won't. But, you know, we can talk about this for... 10 billion years, so, uh, good lord. Is Jace being used by the girl? Oh, we'll get into that. We'll get into Jace and Mel and their particular relationship, because it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting relationship that they have. Like, Jace and Victor have a very... And we'll talk about, like, the whole queer coding thing as well. <laughs> Sky and come to Brazil? No. I cannot travel internationally right now. Are you crazy? Um... We'll talk about that as well. Um, we'll get into it. Boy, chat is going fast. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm just gonna have to turn on slow mode for the chat because I cannot follow what's being said. There we go. Kate Vi, Kate Vi, Kate Vi. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Do you think they're doing copaganda? I mean, uh, this is. As much as any show that features cops tends to. Yeah, sure. Will the stream be saved? Yes. Yes, it will. Do I know my Brazilian fan base? I actually do. Uh, according to the analytics on my channel, I think it's something like 1.3% of the views on my channel. Something like that comes from Brazil. According to YouTube analytics. I can actually check it. Let me just go and check. Because I have the demographics on like where views are coming from. That might have changed like because it goes by month to month. Let me see. Reach. Uh, audience. So like geographic. Top geographies. Let's see. 
The United States and the Philippines are my two biggest markets somehow. <laughs> then Germany, Canada, United Kingdom, and then Brazil. Oh, actually, Brazil this month has been responsible for 4% of my total views. <laughs> Which is, I don't know how I have fans in the Philippines. I don't, uh, but hey, <laughs> I am Mr. Worldwide, I suppose. <laughs> oh, chat is going a million miles now. Mexico, Philippines, South Africa, hey. Hello there, Greece. Boy, people from <laughs> from from Russia. <laughs> Does that even mean hello? I'm not sure. A score for Scanner Boy. It's good. But yeah, apparently I have a lot of audience from a lot of places in the world. Okay, we are closing in on five minutes past the hour. Uh, so we'll get started in just a sec. But, oh, super chat from, uh, if I could just see who that super chat was from. Hang on. It was from Noah West. Uh, all your right work aside, Eldering has group passwords for community interactions and building. When you start playing, will you set up? up? Yes, I will. There will be a community password thing going on once we're doing Elden Ring. But that that's that's well in the future still. That's well in the future still. Enjoying Ruin King Story. Yes, I am enjoying that game a lot. If you want to follow it, I'm playing it over on my Let's Play channel, um, which is youtubecom slash 2 and uh, link in the description to that. When is the full episode animation unless is coming? I can't. I'm sorry, Seth. I've like I've tried. I like I've tried to talk to some people and stuff, and there's just there's no way to get permission for that. So I have found another way. We will be doing animation breakdowns. Just I can't do a whole episode. Um, much as I would like to. Oh, uh, Carson Brinkman, thank you for that super chat. That's very generous of you. Uh, love your content as always. Was wondering as someone who was already versed in League lore. What do you think about seeing Arcane on a large scale? Are you excited to see it on Netflix and see a ton of people see League for the first time? I mean, that's been an interesting part of Arcane, hasn't it? Uh, is people, like, um... It's like coming to Arcane and discovering all these characters, and then they start to play League of Legends and find that it's maybe... It's maybe, it's maybe not quite the experience that they were expecting, because it's League of Legends, and it is the most beginner unfriendly game on the face of the earth, quite possibly. Uh, so that's been fun, uh, which is why I'm glad Legends of Runeterra exists, and like the Ruined King game also, because like that'll that'll be a way for people to uh, engage with League of Legends without having to play <laughs> League of Legends of all video games. Oh lord, um, Dota has a better tutorial, Henrique. It has a much better tutorial. League of Legends has one of the worst tutorials in AAA gaming. I don't... Like, it's it's insane how poor the onboarding is for League of Legends. Okay. Right. Well, we are eight minutes past the hour, which means people have had time to see the notifications going off. Uh, so, let's get into it. Let me pull up my notes here. There we go. So, we might as well start with Act 1, right? And Act 1 pulls an interesting little... It, it pulls an interesting little trick right from the start. Which is that Act 1, for most of the show... Or for most, for most of Act 1, the show is acting very strictly within a genre. And that genre is Kit's adventure film, right? Like, it, it's, it's acting very strictly within this genre of a Kit's adventure story. As in, we have these misfit kids from Zaun who are sort of trying to get by in the world and love... They feel inadequate and they're, like, pulling these heists and stuff and they're running from the, from the police. And the tone... Uh, I'll turn down the music, yes. Uh, and the tone of the show in the, in the first, like, 90% of it is, like, very light, honestly. Like, th there's some serious moments and stuff like that, and, like, you're scared of, of um, like, Silco and the guy that he's juicing up with Shimmer. But mostly it sticks very closely to this tone of, like, a kid's adventure show. Something like, something along the veins of, like, the Goonies um, and things like that. And that's a tone that it keeps all the way up until the rescue attempt with Vander, where it seems like, like, right there at the end, when they're, when they're trying to rescue Vander, like, they've blockaded the door that's being knocked on. Clagger breaks the wall and they have a way out and like they freed Vander because like like everyone's skill sets came together and they all managed to do this thing and they managed to save him. And then Jinx sets off the Hextech bomb 
and everything goes straight to hell. Like, that's, that's the moment when the show completely pulls the rug out from under you, because it looks like... It looks so much like, oh, they're gonna make it, like, they're gonna make it. Everyone's skills came together, and the kids cooperated, and every like... The, and even when Jinx sets the bomb off, like, at least the first time I watched it, I was still expecting, okay, like, the bomb is gonna go off, but it's gonna be fine. Like, it's, it's gonna blow... It's gonna blow away the monster, and then Jinx is gonna be like, hey, my bomb finally worked, and Vi is gonna be like, good job, I knew you could do it, and then they're all gonna go home and have cocoa and tea, and everything's gonna be fine. Turns out I was wrong about that. It was not going to be fine. Nothing was going to be fine, and nothing has ever been fine ever since. Um, and that little genre pull is part of what makes Arcane so interesting because it messes about with genre a lot. Because Act Two is a completely different genre of show. Like it's no longer a kids' adventure story at all. Now we're dealing with a um, a political crime drama is essentially what's going on in Act 2, um, where you have this this sort of uh, cat-and-mouse chase between, like, Jinx and Vi as they sort of circle around each other and eventually come together by the very end of, of Act 2. But that's a completely different genre, and you can see that also in the cinematography, in the way that the show chooses to present itself. Um, like, there's, there's, there's tons of little changes to the way the camera acts, the way that they frame things, the way, like, the way the music interacts with... with um, with the show, and it's like, I wish I could pull up examples and sort of show you, but that's gonna have to be in an edited video because I really have to be careful not to use more than, than a few seconds of footage. And as Blubby points out in chat, yes, also there's a sex scene in Act Two, which came, which again is one of those things that for me was like, what, what, what the fuck? Like, I, I, I was not surprised that Mel and Jace like had a thing. I was surprised that they did like a fully like, sort of 90s thriller movie explicit sex scene about it with some really heavy-handed visual metaphors. Like, my God. Um, the sex scene was so awkward. I don't think it was awkward. Um, but it was needed. Ivana in chat is saying that the sex scene wasn't needed. No, it was. Um, like, in the sense that it is necessary for pushing those two characters forward. But we'll... We, we, will, we will get to Jace and Mel and their interesting relationship, um, and the relationship between uh, Jace and Victor also, as we go. So, like, Act 1 is a kid's adventure story, Act 2 is this political thriller drama, and then I expect that we'll get another genre shift for Act 3, where we'll probably, like, that'll, that'll probably be where the show goes full League of Legends. Like, that'll probably be, I, if anywhere it's going to happen, that's going to be the one where... Like, where the show goes full fantasy. Like, where we really get into... Like, because presumably that'll be where Echo gets his Z-Drive so he can do time travel shenanigans. Presumably that'll be where... Like, Vi will get her Atlas Gauntlets, Jace will get his Hextech Hammer, Victor will, like, put on his robot suit or whatever, use his laser arm. Like, that's when shit will go fully off the rails and we'll be fully into League of Legends fantasy territory. But there's gonna be this, this sort of curving arc that leads to it, where Act 3 is the one where everything, like, fully, fully goes wild. And I think the show has done a really good job of that, because, like, by using those genres, by starting in Kit's Adventure, by moving into sort of political thriller drama and crime drama, um, like, it sort of brings the audience along, especially an audience, like, every... no Nobody in the world except League of Legends fans understand League of Legends, and out of the League of Legends fans, like... We are a fairly small minority of League of Legends fans who give a shit about the lore. There's 110 million players, and there's not 110 million lore fans of League of Legends. So starting in a genre that everyone understands, which is Kids Adventure Story, which everyone also understands from the perspective of being an animated show, that's a really savvy move. Like, that's a really smart way to bring the audience into this really high-concept, weird fantasy world and then slowly take them through like a more serious genre to say, hey, no, this is a serious world. And then like my expectation again will be that the third act will be the one that goes most like fantasy bonkers. Um, like that, that's sort of, that's sort of my thinking. I don't think Silco will die, says Dekayan. Yeah, I agree. I think Silco is going to be a champion. I think Silco is going to be a champion. I'm going to like, I'm just going to say it right now that Silco will be a champion. That's my prediction. Uh, cause that's what it looks like to me with, like, cause Riot posted that, um, they posted that roadmap where they talked about, like, they have this champion who, who is like, his whole thing is gonna be, ah, oh, he's, he's manipulating people with money, and he was clearly identified as a Zon champion. It's not the ADC, but the support, um, and that's, I, 
th- that'll be Silco. Like, I'm, I'm reasonably certain that that'll be Silco. Uh, because it's going to be an arcane champion. Like, like there's going to be at least one arcane champion. There has to be. Like, if they, pu- if they made four champions for the goddamn Ruined King event, then they damn well better make at least one for, it, for like, arcane. Probably two, I hope. Anyway, where were we? Right. So we talked about, like, um... Oh, uh, there was a super chat, actually, I, uh, I missed. Uh, right, uh, Derek Casagrande. Thank you for running yourself ragged to keep up with all Riot's random nonsense these past few weeks. Have a lovely day. Thank you very much. I have been, I have been burning the candle a little bit at both ends. Once this frickin', once the show is over, I'm gonna take a break. <laughs> uh. So, let's talk about, um some of the main character arcs for the characters. Like, because Vi and Powder are the central characters, right? Like, Vi and Jinx, they're the central characters of the show. Everything else sort of revolves around them, and they are sort of central to everything that happens. And that begins right from the first episode, because, like, it's Vi and Jinx breaking into Jace's apartment that becomes the inciting incident for everything to kick off, right? Um... Like, once they steal the Hextech crystals, that's when, like, the, the there's an explosion in the upper city, which causes Jace's research to be outed, which means that he gets thrown out of the academy, which means he finds his way, like, gets together with Victor. They become science partners. They invent Hextech. Like, that wouldn't have happened if Vi and, 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 and Powder hadn't broken into his apartment. And that also becomes the thing that sort of precipitates, like, the police cracking down on the lanes, the Undercity. It also, it's also the thing that precipitates the Undercity beginning to rise up and go, like, fuck this shit, we're gonna, we're gonna kick these cops out of our streets, which is what Silco uses to take power, which is what causes Vander's, like, uh, power to sort of begin to, begin to vein and, and, uh, fade. Um, so, like, they are the inciting incident. Like, their little kitty adventure heist thing is the thing that precipitates all of the action of basically the entire show um and that's very again structurally that's a good thing to do because it keeps them central to the action even when in act one like vi and powder like their storyline is only really something that affects them mostly right like it's just them trying to lay low from the cops and eventually trying to save vander so structurally that's very clever the other structural thing in Act 1 that's really clever is um, if you notice the character arcs of the various characters, the way that they work is that Vi and Powder and the, the kids, they start the episode on a high note, right? Like, they start with a successful heist. They manage, to, like, they manage to beat those kids and get home. They lose their loot, but, like, it's still, like, it's just sort of, hey, that's a, it's a nice starting point for a kid's adventure movie. Jace, on the other hand, begins the show at his absolute lowest point ever. Like, literally, having been thrown out of the Academy, his dream is gone. He's compl- he's completely fucked. Like, he- his life has been fucked up. He's at his lowest point as a person to the point where he considers suicide, right? And then as the arc goes on, as the act act one goes on, Jace's star begins to rise, right? Like, he everything gets better and better and better and better for him from the start of the story, up until, up until the end of, of Act 1. Whereas for the kids, everything just goes down, and it goes down and down and down and down. And that mirrors the invention of Hextech, right? Which is something that comes to a head in Episode 3, where we see Jason and Victor sort of successfully finally inventing Hextech, and like finally like breaking into Heimerdinger's lab, and finally they invent Hextech, and it works, and they're floating around, they're happy, they're laughing, hey, what's the ha? There's, we've made Hextech, yay, good job, J- good job, uh, Jace, would you kiss me on the mouth, yay. Um, and everything's sort of very happy and light and floaty and, and lovely for them, but that's contrapointed with what the technology of Hextech does in the undercity of Son, right? Um, where for Jace and Victor, it represents this, like, literally it represents a freedom from gravity. Like, it literally lifts them up off the ground to float about in the space of, you know, Nebulous ideas, and it, it's their Hextech dream. It's this thing that ties them together. It's this wonderful innovation that that they have made together, and it's going to make the world a better place, and everyone's optimistic. In Zon, immediately, the first thing that happens with Hextech in Zon is it kills two children and and their father and almost kills, like, another person. Like, the first thing that happens with Hextech, and that's the thing, is, like, Heimerdinger warns them, 
all the time. Like, this technology is dangerous. Magic cannot be controlled. You need to be careful about how you do this. We need to be careful about how we research this. We need to be careful about how we implement this, because if we don't, someone's going to get hurt. And that's what happens. Like, in the moment that Hextech is invented, it also murders several children. Right? And that's, again, the parallels that the show loves to do is, um, is to set up these parallel arcs between Piltover and Zaun, between Vi and Jinx, between Vander and Silco, between Jace and Victor, like between Heimerdinger and Singed, and like all these constant parallels of different perspectives on the same idea, um, where Hextech is, is obviously a wonderful thing for Piltover. Like, it enriches Piltover. It makes it a much more glorious city. It becomes the city of innovation and, like, this renaissance of art and science happens. And then in Act 2, when we see Zaun, on the other hand, everything is, like, has become this, like, sort of dark industrial, almost sort of cyberpunky a little bit. Um, very modernized city, but it's also, like, it's full of neon light and drugs and violence and it's like everything has kind of gotten worse um, in, in, in Zaun, conjunctively with everything getting better in Piltover, right? And there's constantly these parallel arcs of like things that, that benefit someone, fuck someone else over. Am I going to upload this live stream on the channel? That's what I'm doing right now, Thelio. Um, we, we are currently uploading the live stream to the channel by streaming it live uh, to the channel. And it will be archived here, so you can watch it later. Don't worry about it. If you have, if you have to dip out, it's fine. Anyway, uh, a couple of super chats. Duran Duran, the show opens on a bit of a time setter, doesn't it? Not a high note with uh, Jinx and Vi's parents dead. I mean, yeah, that's the pre that's the prologue. That's not really the opening act of the of the show. That's again structurally. Um, that's the prologue to the show. Like that's we see the fundamental trauma, and that's another thing to talk about actually is that opening scene because like that's the scene that immediately establishes um you remember the cops in the very opening scene of the show as they kind of just walk around on the bridge and execute people that are lying on the ground remember though remember the masks that they're wearing and like the way that the show frames them like they have this Darth Vader breathing like <sighs> like and they look like these skull-faced monsters. Like, that's how the show opens, right? And we open in that scene inside Powder's perspective specifically. Like, we can literally see the little scribbles on the screen that become emblematic of her perspective later. <coughs> <coughs> um, and again, like that... But that's that's the that's the prologue. That's not the opening scene of, of, of the show, as it were. Anyway. Where was it? Right. Parallel arcs. So this obsession with parallel arcs, right? That continues in the second act of the show. And here we, instead of Jace and, and Victor being like one grouped, uh, grouped character who are experiencing one arc over, um, like where they invent Hextech and everything's great, they now become two separate arcs. And they, again, we have this parallel arc of ascent and decline where Jace becomes a counselor, he gains all this political power, he becomes popular, he's the golden boy of Piltover, he gets a girlfriend. He has this constant upward arc, um, like where everything keeps getting better for him in a lot of ways. He also becomes more and more corrupt as he goes, but like everything keeps sort of going better and better for him. He, he keeps becoming more and more popular, gets more and more power. Whereas for Victor, everything is declining very, very rapidly, both like his health, his relationship with Jace, like his ability to do the research that he wants. It's all declining really, really fast. So again, we have these parallel arcs that sort of, that give us two perspectives on the same thing happening, um, which which I think is, is like genuinely quite fantastic. Uh, and the same thing with like, uh, with Vi and Jinx. Like with Jinx, um, she's been in the world since Act 1. She's been taught by Silco, and she's changed a lot as a person, right? She has changed a lot, but she also hasn't changed at all. Like, she's still that little scared, codependent child who completely relies on other people to sort of tether her to reality and keep her from falling apart under the weight of her own traumas. And, like, she's even been deeply more traumatized by the like by, by, by the realization that she's not facing but which she has in the back of her head that she killed Clagger and that she killed Milo like she didn't it was an accident but their ghosts are quite literally haunting her <laughs> on the other hand Vi has been completely shut away from the world right like she's been in prison and 
completely shut away from everything and unable to act and very much again has that parallel arc where she has changed a lot but she also hasn't changed at all like these parallels between the characters that like they've they've both sort of been stuck in a state kind of a, of arrested development um that's very interesting which also leads into like the relationship between silco let's talk about silco actually let's set up silco um so that we can talk about him a little bit because silco is a really interesting villain he's a really interesting villain um because, like, and again, in Act 1, he's he's acting mostly as the stereotypical uh, kid's adventure movie villain. Which is that he's the, he's the evil bad guy who's the crime man who does the crimes. And he does the evil stuff and the kids are going to beat him and then they're going to rescue their dad and then everything's going to be fine, right? Like, for the most part, he's kind of shallow in Act 1. For the most part. Where we kind of see him, like, he gives this speech about, let me tell you a story. Like, well, a lesson that I learned when I was about your age, boy. Power comes to those who will do anything to achieve it. Like, he might as well have a big mustache on and go, <laughs> while lightning strikes in the background. Like, he's that level of villain in the first act. Again, right up until, right up until the very end, when we finally get to see him talk to Vander, like, where he, where he reveals that there's a little bit more to him than just doing evil stuff because evil, um, that he has this nationalistic dream for Son, Like, he wants the undercity of Piltover to break away and become an independent city because, as he sees it, that is... That's the only way for Piltover to... For, for Zon to gain the respect from Piltover that they deserve. It's the only way for things to get better in the undercity. And in that way, he is a contrast with Vander. Because Vander... Like, he doesn't really love Piltover at all, but Vander has given up. Vander is someone who has given up on the idea of things ever getting better. Like, that's fundamentally his character, and it's a sympathetic thing. Like, he gave up on it because they tried. Like, they tried to march over the bridge. They tried to assert themselves. They tried to force Piltover to recognize their rights and to make things better. And all they got out of it was a mountain of corpses, right? Like, so you understand completely why Vander has given up. At this point, Vander believes the best he can possibly do is to not make things worse. There's no better. Like, there's no better for him. There's no... We can't do anything about Piltover. We can't make the lanes a better place, particularly. But we can at least not make it worse, right? And that's also how he's protecting the kids. Like, by just by just desperately trying to hold things together with both hands and maintain the status quo so that nothing changes for the better, but also nothing changes for the worse. Because he has seen what worse looks like and he's not willing to go there. Um, and that's what Silco is, sort of the contrast, is that Silco is willing to do it. Like, he's willing to make all of the sacrifices. Mostly, like, and that's the thing to notice about Silco. He's willing to make, he's willing to make huge sacrifices to assert independence from Piltover, but mostly sacrifices of other people, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, it's not, mostly sacrifices of other people. Um, that's why he's a villain. Um... But Silco is the one who still has a vision. Like, he still has a vision for Son can be a better place. Like, we can do something to make the world better. We can do something to do it. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice and violence and blood and death, but something can be done, and we're going to do it. Right? Like, not with anyone's consent. Like, Silco doesn't really care if everyone else in Zon agrees with him on going to do this thing. He's just going to make a bunch of monsters and throw them at Piltover and do it. Uh, and then a lot of people are going to get killed, but he thinks it's for the greater good. Like, that's that's his villainy, is that, that Vander is someone who actually cares about the consent of the people that he's leading, where Silco is like, nah, consent is optional, fuck you, we're going to do this thing because that's my vision. Which ties into Silco's character design, by the way. Silco is all about vision. Like, he's all about, he has this vision of Zahn that he's so obsessed with. And in conjunction with that, he has this corrupted eye. Right? Like, literally telling you that his vision is corrupt. Like, that th this thing he sees, this this thing he saw in the water is toxic, it's poisonous, right? Um, and that's the character design working overtime again to tell you that the guy's a villain. I'm not a huge fan of when a villain is denoted by, like, hey, how do we make a villain? I don't know, just give him some sort of deformity. Like, that's, ugh, that's, that's like, it's a, it's a trope that has some bad history. <laughs> Uh, and I wish we wouldn't use it so much, but, you know, it it works for the purposes um, that, that it's supposed to work for. 
But anyway, Silco, he is an idealist and he's an ideologue, right? Like he's someone who, who has this vision of the future of, of a way that he wants the world to be and he's willing to do anything to achieve it. Like as he says, like power comes to those who are willing to do anything for it and so he does. And what makes him interesting, like what moves him beyond just being a cartoon villain, is that he has empathy. Like he has empathy. He has like the ability to care for other people and put other people's needs above his own. He doesn't always do it, but he can do it. And the place that we see this is in the scene with Powder at the very end. Like Powder at this point is, is dissolved, like she's fallen apart. Because she's codependent, because she 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 relies so heavily on other people for her emotional stability. When Vi, when she thinks that Vi has abandoned her, she falls apart. Like she completely disintegrates. Like her entire world falls apart, and she is in free fall, completely in free fall. Um, and that's like she, she her entire world is falling apart. Which is why when Silco approaches her. The only thing she knows what to do is to like to jump at him and hug him and cling to him because at this point just she needs anything or anyone to make the world not so scary anymore because she's a child like she's a, she's a child with a huge amount of trauma who saw her parents getting murdered and she can't she can't face the trauma of having like of having to lose her parent figure again which she did with with Vi and Silco sees himself in her like and that's very very obvious like when 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 powder is hugging him and she says like my sister left me she abandoned me silco like we cut to his perspective and he looks over at the body of vander and you can kind of see that oh no yeah i've been there like i've had the person who i thought like was 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 my brother like has abandoned me before i know what that feels like and she goes like she's not my sister anymore and like he's like no you can see it in his eyes like the way he stares into the middle distance that he knows what that feels like and in that moment he genuinely does empathize with her that doesn't mean he's a good person like that doesn't mean that their relationship isn't some version of toxic but he sees himself in her which is why he's he, he like which is why he embraces her. He hugs her. He says, it's all right. And then the thing he says, which is probably one of the scariest things that he has said, is we'll show them. We'll show them all. Right? Like, because that's who he is. Like, that's his ethos is we're going to fucking show him. We're going to show Piltover. We're going to show them all. We're going to, like, we're going to get our vengeance. Um, And that's why when we come to Act 2, they have that somewhat disturbing relation like a lot of people have been very squicked out by the way that jinx and silco interact in act two and that's because like we are so conditioned when there is physical intimacy between a male character and a female character that it is some sort of like it's sexual right like it it, it has to be surely i really don't read it that way silco and jinx like because jinx is in such a state of arrested development she's still mentally a child in a lot of ways, she's still so dependent on him emotionally that it's not really a... I don't think it's a sexual thing. I think it's a, it's a deep emotional dependency, but it is more of a sort of weird father-daughter thing that they've got going on. I don't think there is any sexual implication between the two of them. It's just that, like, we are conditioned to read it that way. Um... Which, you know, but they do have an intimacy, and I think it's meant to be a little bit weird. I think it's meant to be a little bit off-putting. Like, it's meant to be like, hey, isn't she a little old to be, like, draping herself over him like that? Isn't that a little... Like, yeah, it is, because Jinx is... Like, Jinx in her heart is still a child. Um, and so she still acts with him the way a child would act with their father. So, you know. And Silco is constantly trying to... Like, he's trying to mold her in his own image. He's trying to teach her how he thinks, why he thinks the way he does. He's trying to to get her to be the same way that he is. That's what that baptism scene is. Like, when they go to the river and Silku gives her that whole speech and, like, he puts her in the water, that's because he's trying to recreate the conditions of his own awakening, right? Um, because we get that scene at the start of, of, of um, Act 3, 
uh, not Act 3, Episode 3, where we see Silco in the water, where he talks about how, like, almost being drowned by Vander, that was the thing that awakened him mentally to the idea that, no, if we want to beat Piltover, we have to be willing. Like, it awakened him to his philosophy. And he's trying to do the same thing to Jinx. Like, he's trying to give her that same experience in order, like, he's trying to help her. Like, that's what he thinks he's doing. He's trying to help her. He's trying to give her that same vision that same confidence in herself, that same stability that he has within himself, he's trying to pass it on to her. Um, but it's like, but because that's not really what Jinx needs, it doesn't really work, right? Um, so, so like, is and that's how their relationship is toxic, right? Is that 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 Silco wants Jinx to be like him, but that's not really what Jinx needs. J Jinx doesn't need to be like him. Jinx needs her sister, and she needs a lot of therapy. Uh, she needs to be able to forgive herself, right? Um, but it's like, it's not... But it, the relationship between them is therefore interesting. Because it's not that he's trying to be an abusive prick. It's not that he's trying to hurt her. It's not It's not really that he's trying to, to, to do anything wrong. He believes he's in the right. He believes that he's helping. Like, he believes that. He's wrong, but he believes it. And that's what makes him interesting. <sighs> ah, I need a sip of tea. Yeah, Silk is, Silco is a bad father. Like him, but he is also like again and again in Act Two. We also see Silco protecting her. Like when when Sevika, his henchman, his henchwoman with a mechanical arm, is like, "This girl is a liability. She needs to be thrown out. Like we can't we can't be with her." He holds like he protects her, and goes. No, like you're not. She, this is my daughter. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. You're not gonna turn me against her. It. Like, I'm gonna blame you on this on you instead, and I'm gonna protect her. Like he's constantly also protecting her. He's constantly also being forgiving of her in a way that he isn't of his other henchmen. So like it is a, it is a father daughter relationship, not necessarily a healthy one or a good one, but it is. Um, and it's a father-daughter relationship between Silco and Jinx in exactly the same way that there's a father-daughter relationship between Vander and Vi. Again, the show loves parallels. It loves to parallel these things. So, like, Silco and Jinx parallel Vander and Vi. And uh, that's... The whole show is structured around these parallels. <laughs> now, the thing, the thing that bothers me about Silco is that, like, his stated ideology, right is that, yes, we shall make the nation of Zaun, and then something, something, things will get better, right? Like, his ideology, his his idea for what Zaun should be, for how he's going to make the world better, it's not really, like, it, it's never explored. It's never actually, it's never actually pushed anywhere. Um, nothing is ever really done with it. It's just, he just kind of goes, we shall have the nation of Zaun, and then respect and then and like my disappointment there is that like like Zon doesn't need an doesn't need like a nation like they don't need to be a nation they need healthcare they need to not be living in pollution all the time like they need economic independence they need to not have the piltover police walking through their streets like stormtroopers throwing people through windows and like brutalizing people and drag them off to prison with no trial of any kind. Like they have some very specific material needs that would make Zaun a better place to live. And Silco sort of never really addresses that. Like he never really talks about, okay, like once we have this nation of Zaun, once we have this independence, that then that, that, that then what like what are we gonna like are we gonna establish schools are we like what what are we gonna do like how are you gonna make the world better it's just, he just has this no no we shall we shall be independent and then respect and then something something the world is better and that's like it feels like he should have a plan for that like it feels like he should at some point articulate how he wants to make the world better like, at some point, someone in the show really should articulate what the problems are. Because the problem isn't just that Piltover doesn't respect Zaun. Like, it's not... Respect isn't the problem. The problem is that their police are acting like an occupying army in Zaun. The problem is that people in Zaun are poor. The problem is that people in Zaun are living in toxic smog and dying. And that they have no prospects of a better life. That they have no prospects of, of like, having a better world in front of them. 
um, that they are desperate and they are deprived and that that they're dying. Like that's, it's not about respect. It's about like these people have material needs that aren't being met. And that's why they're upset. And the show is never really articulating that. It's sort of under, it's sort of implied. It's sort of under the surface. You can sort of figure it out, but the show never articulates what is actually the conflict between Piltover and Zaun beyond, oh, well, Piltover people don't like Zaunites and Zaunites don't like Piltover people and um, like it never really articulates it. It just kind of gestures at it and doesn't really doesn't really specify it. And I think that makes Silco a weaker villain because like if Silco had an actual compelling vision, like if he actually had this thing, we're gonna build schools. We're gonna have like like we're gonna have light in Zon again. Like we're gonna we're gonna make sure that sunlight can get down here. We're gonna talk like we're gonna give people health care. We're going to, like, if he had some kind of compelling vision that sort of told us, oh, this is why people follow him. This is why people care about him. This is why people, like, are willing to be his, his like, his henchmen. That would be more interesting to me. And that's, like, I wish the show would articulate that. It's not really what the show is about, unfortunately, but... I, I wish they would. <laughs> Free89 says in chat, then he wouldn't be an evil guy. Yeah, I mean, funny that. It's it's funny how how if if you had a, a character in the show who actually articulated the needs of Zaun rather than just being vaguely characterized as a guy who wants revenge or whatever, you, it would be hard to classify him as a villain. It's almost as though, it's almost as though, it's almost as though there's something about those policies that's inherently good. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe healthcare is a good thing, actually. Maybe that's really hard to argue against morally, that people should have healthcare. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That, that's, I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> um, It's not like fascists normally have good plan for their country. Yeah, no, like, that's... Mm, uh, you. I, I wish you were right about that, but, like, the thing is, like, like when you look at fascist regimes... Like, they do have that. Like, they do make those promises. Like, they don't keep them. Like, they're, they are they, they abuse people, and they generally make capitalism even worse because they coexist peacefully with it. But, like, fascists tend to have those promises. Like, they tend to have those promises about, oh, no, no, we're, like, we're gonna, like, people are gonna have free healthcare and, like, the streets are gonna be paved with gold. Like, they tend to make those promises, even if they don't intend to keep them, even if they intend to murder other people in order to get to it, they tend to make the promises. Silco hasn't. Like, there, there hasn't been a scene of him actually making the promises for the things that are going to get better. And that's kind of, that's what I'm a little disappointed in, is that the show isn't really articulating the nature of the conflict between Piltover and Zaun, which is not just a conflict of culture, it's a material conflict. But anyway, um... Oh, Matthias T. Nilsson, Skyne, I think Silco's philosophy and plan is broken on purpose because it's not driven by empathy for the people of Zaun. It's based on hatred and resentment of Piltover. Yeah, and that's again, I, I talked about this in my Politics of Arcane video, but that's like, that's how Riot has, a, and not just Riot, but like, like neoliberals have a tendency to write all revolutionaries in this way that, oh, they're just resentful. Like, they're, ju they're just resentful, they're angry, they are like, they're vengeful, and they never really you don't get a lot of stories that actually sort of address the, the actual material conditions that lead to people being upset at a social order. But that's, that's a whole thing that's outside of Arcane. Moving back to actually talking about Arcane itself. We'll get to Caitlyn and Vi. Don't worry, we'll get there. I know a lot of people in chat are excited about it. For the moment, I want to talk about Jace and Victor. And I want some tea. And in fact, let me just put some different uh, stuff in the background there. Let me do this. There we go. Slideshow. So, Caitlyn is interesting. She's an interesting character because, like, um, she's one of the enforcers. Like, she, she is of the Piltover police. Um, and she's very much of the Piltover elite, right? Like, she's, she's the daughter of these counselors living in this high fancy estates and like very deeply enmeshed in the power structures of Piltover, very deeply enmeshed in the privileges of Piltover. She doesn't want them, but she is in, um, right. We're doing Victor. God damn it. I confused myself. <laughs> I confused myself. <laughs> Not Caitlin and Vi. Victor and Jace first. Yes. Victor and Jace. Oh, right. I, I ended up on Caitlin because she's the assistant to Jace and I kind of wanted to, okay. Um, let me just reset my brain for a second here. I'm an idiot. 
I'm not needy. I'm just tired. <laughs> Wrong gaze. Yeah, I know. I love Doritos. <laughs> okay, let's try that one again. Jace and Victor. And we'll start with Jace. Because he... Um, He's one of those characters that I feel like is a little bit underdeveloped in the show. And that's sort of an artifact that the show is structured into these, like, three arcs of three episodes each, right? Three acts. And there just isn't any time in those shows for any, for any, like, for any fat on the gristle. Like, there's just isn't time to take a lot of time to really characterize characters. And so Jace arrives as this sort of idealistic young man who's like, yes, once upon a time, my mom almost died. And then a mage saved my mom, so now I want to do magic, right? Like, that's sort of the extent of backstory that he gets. It's like, why is he the way he is? Well, because once upon a time, his mom always died, and then magic happened. Um, and that's why he's so obsessed with science magic. And he kind of needs a little more development on that front, I think. Uh, like, in terms of, of really digging into why he is the way he is. Again, if you read between the lines, you understand it, right? Jace, as a child, saw his mother almost die. And in this moment, like, when he feels the most alone, when he feels the most like he has no control over the world, when he feels the most out of his depth and terrified, and when he's at his absolute lowest and most scared, the thing that saves him is magic. That's why he's obsessed with magic, is because, like, it for him, in his mind, this is the only thing that allows, that, that like, allows you to take back control over the world. That allows you to, like, that allows you to, to fix the unfixable, like, and undo impossible conundrums, and, like, allows you to transcend the limits of mortality, essentially. Like, for him, magic saved him in his most vulnerable moment that he's ever had in his life, and therefore, like, he becomes obsessed with it. Like, he becomes obsessed. This must be possible to control. This must be possible to, to like, make this a thing that, that everyone can have access to, because then the world becomes a better place. Like, that's why he is the way he is. He has this emotional trauma that he's not, he has never really fully dealt with, and the way that he sort of processes the trauma of that childhood fear is to chase control over magic. Um, and that's kind of why he is the way he is. The other thing about Jace, though, is that he has an ego. Like, he has a big ego. A really big ego. Not not a malicious ego. Like, it's not evil. Like, it's not like, like I am the greatest person in the world and you are all dirt before me. Not, not, not like that kind of ego. He's not self-obsessed. But he has an ego on him. Which makes sense because he wants to change the world, right? He wants to change the world. He wants to make the world a better place. He wants to invent revolutionary new ideas. That requires an ego. So he has an ego on him, but he's not very conscious of it. He doesn't really fully understand the amount of his ego. And that ego makes him vulnerable to manipulation. And more than that, it doesn't just make him vulnerable to manipulation. It makes him amenable to it. It makes him like manipulation. It makes him like being flattered. It makes him like being told that he's special, that he can do something fantastic, that he needs to step up to the plate and take leadership and, like, like uh, take control over things. He likes it. That's why Mel can manipulate him. And we'll get to Mel. Like, she's not she's not a fully evil character either. She's a good, she's a villain, but she's a good villain. Um, like, that's, and that's Jace, right? Like, he's this, he's this, he's earnest, he's honest, he has a good heart, he's not, like, evil, but he is egotistical. And Victor observes this about him the very first, like, the, the, like, not the first time they meet, but the second time they meet. When Victor walks in with Jace's notes, he goes like, oh, you signed every page. A <laughs> little egotistical, don't you think? And Victor is making a joke, but he's not wrong. Like, Jace has an ego on it. Um, and that ego is, like, his critical flaw as a character. Um... And so Jace's arc, like I said previously, it's all about a continuous upward slope, right? Like, he's constantly, things are always getting better for him. Like, he starts at a low point, and this just keeps getting better for him. Like, he keeps becoming more and more famous, he keeps becoming more and more popular, and everything keeps getting better for him. But what's happening in conjunction with that is that he's developing this relationship with Mel. And Mel manipulates... Jace from the moment that they meet. The first time they ever meet is in the courtroom, right? In the trial. When he's on trial for experimenting with illegal materials that are actually incredibly dangerous, 
um, Mel is looking for, like, she, she knows that she needs some kind of revolutionary invention. So she's just looking for, okay, this kid, these dangerous experiments, what the hell was he doing? Um, what was he doing? Am I having connection issues? No, okay. Um, the first time they meet, Mel, like, she, she sort of senses that v uh, Jace is being, um, He's not telling her everything, right? Like when he's talking about Heimerding has told Jace, "Hey, just be humble. Just say, oops, I did a, I did an oopsie. I did a bad. Uh, please let me keep my studies, and everything will be fine." So Jace goes up before the council. And he goes, "I'm sorry. I didn't understand what I was doing. I'm very, like, like I'm, I'm terribly sorry for what I've done. I would, I would like to request that I be permitted to continue to study. And if he hadn't gone any further." He probably would have been permitted to continue to study. Like, it probably would have been swept under the rug, and Heimerdinger would kind of been able to protect him. But Mel needles him. Mel is, starts talking to him like, so your your research was dumb and pointless, and it was dumb research for idiot people? It was stupid research? It was, it was pointless, dumb research that was never going to lead to anything? No discoveries at all? And Jace's ego kicks in, because, like, he's like, no, it was revolutionary research, but I can't say that because then I get just, God damn it. And then he explodes and he goes, I wanted to harness magic. And then he gives his speech about like, we're scientists, we're supposed to make the world a better place. And that's what makes Victor fall in love with him. Um, but yeah, Mel pushes him because she's looking for something that she can use. And he gives it to her. Like, like when she needles his ego, he gives it to her immediately. Um, and that's sort of the start of their relationship is that Mel pushes him. Always, every scene they're in together, every time they have an emotional connection, Mel pushes him towards something. Towards being more assertive, towards like taking more radical action, towards put, making, putting himself in more of a leadership position. She's always pushing him. And that's part of their relationship that makes them interesting. Um, because like Jace, Jace doesn't push back. Like, Jace doesn't push back. That's the thing I said. Like, he likes having his ego flattered. He likes being told that he should be in control of things, that he should be in power. He likes being told those things. So when Mel pushes, he doesn't push back. He goes along because he wants to be pushed. That's their relationship. Like, a lot of people have sort of identified that Mel manipulates Jace, and they've sort of gone, oh, Mel is evil, therefore. But no, it's not that simple. It's not, like, Mel isn't just manipulating Jace, she's enabling him, right? It's it's a bit of a two-way street there. Um, and so, as Jace gains more and more fame, and as he gains more and more notoriety, like, like he's not trying to hog the spotlight. He's always trying to bring Victor with him. Like, this is, we're partners, this is both our thing. And Victor, like, but when Victor says, no, no, I shouldn't go on stage, not in front of all these people. Like, when he says that, Again, it's not that Jace tries to push him away from the spotlight, but when Victor says, no, I don't want to go on stage, Jace doesn't push. Like, again, Jace just goes along, okay, well, you don't want to go on stage, well, I'm going to go on stage, and I'm going to have a great time. Um, so, again, it's, it's this thing of, like, his ego is not malicious, it's not evil, it's just... It's just there all the time. Um... And as he becomes a counselor, as he becomes more and more enmeshed in pilt over politics, that's also when he begins to become corrupt. Because, like, the first thing he does when he becomes a counselor, right, is that he, we see his honesty at work. Like, he, 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 um, increases security, he begins to fight corruption, he begins to go, well, I mean, clearly there's something wrong here, we need to... We need to, th to do things right, we need to protect the people of Piltover. Where Mel then eventually tells him, like, well, if you keep doing that, Everyone's, you're going to make an enemy out of everyone, and they're going to take your research away from you. But if you just play a little bit by the by the rules of the game, if you just play a little bit, if you play ball with people a little bit, if you just, like, if, if you scratch someone's back, and they scratch yours back, it's fine. Like, it's harmless. Everyone does it. It's okay. And Jace sort of begins to go, okay, I can play this game. Like, he, he sort of thinks he can play this game that Mel is playing as well. Because he has an ego on Like, he thinks he can do it. He thinks he could be as slick, as smart, as clever as she is. And so he goes along with it. He can't. Like, Mel is very much in control of their relationship. But, you know, it's like... But he thinks he can because he has an ego on him. Um, and as we move up into, into the show, like, by the time they finally consummate their relationship, right? Like, by the, by the time Jace and Mel fuck... They fuck. 
that's the thing that they do. They fuck. Um, by the time they do that, the way that that scene is coded, and I wish I could show it, like, I wish I could just show the goddamn scene, because the visual language is fantastic. Um, it's coded and it's shown as an infidelity, right? Like, we see Victor in his lab working hard at work. Victor is loyal to their dream, their Hextech dream. The thing that they initially be became partners over was their Hextech dream. Victor is loyal to that dream. He's working on it. He's spending, literally spending his lifeblood. He's pouring his lifeblood into Hextech. Like, that's literally what's happening is he's bleeding on, on the table and then that's what pushes the research forward. He literally pours his life into it. Meanwhile, Jace is pouring something else into his relationship with Mel. He's, he's pouring an entirely different fluid um, into that relationship. Um... But that scene, like, that juxtaposition is, like, the way it's shown is as though Jace is cheating, not on Victor as such, like, not on, not on Victor as his boyfriend, but he's cheating on their dream. He's cheating on the Hextech dream that they shared. He's cheating on the work in order to go and, like, nurture his ego. Um, and that's the way in which, like, when... We'll, we'll get into the queer coding of the relationship between Jace and Victor in just a little bit. Um, but that's the way in which, like, a lot of people have read them as having, like, more than just a friendly relationship. Like, more than just a brotherhood. Even though Jace, like, I, he's like a brother to me. Like, more than that. And part of the reason why is because the dream that they share is intimate. Like, it's an intimate dream. Um, like, it's, it, like, this is Jace's... Like, when Jace brings Hextech to Victor, that's his deepest dream. Like, that's his deepest desire. That's that's the thing that matters to him the most in his whole world. And he lets Victor into that. That's an, that's an act of intimacy. Like, that's an act of... of trust. And again, not necessarily romantic intimacy. It can be. Not necessarily. Um, and that's a very, very important close relationship between these two men, right? And that's why you get some queer coding. That's why you can read that as a queer relationship if you want to. The show does do a little bit of no homo, which is kind of tedious. Like Mel, especially like the relationship with Mel is often read as a no homo. I would say to that, like Mel and Jace having a relationship is not no homo. It's just like bi people exist. So like, it's not like, it's not like that precludes it, but I understand fully why people read it that way. Anyway, uh, let me just pull something up on the screen, because I need... I don't have that. I don't have a text box. Okay. Uh, well, let me just do this. I need a little break. I'm going to the bathroom, um, and I am getting some more tea. So I'll be back in a little bit, and you all just hang out and talk about how Victor and Jace are boyfriends in the meantime, shall you? See you in a moment. Or, well, make it 10 minutes or something. <laughs>
Okay, there we go. The T took a little longer than I thought. <laughs> Sorry to jump scare you. Um, right, okay. Uh, let's. Oh boy, there's been some super chats while I was waiting. Um, Seth B. Silco's a good father. He even let her record a song. <laughs> That's funny. Silco and Vic are very similar and yet so different. Yeah. There's definitely a parallel between Silco and Victor, and I think that's going to come up a lot more in Act 3, is where we're really going to see, like, like Silco and Victor specifically have some sort of parallel arc to the two of them. Uh, the ACP sounds more like he doesn't have a plan. The stuff about respect is just his excuse to get revenge. He doesn't care about Zaun. He just hates Piltover. Like, yeah, that's... that's... Riot often writes their villains like that. Silas is like that. Sarath is like that. Like, it's anytime that there's a villain who has a particular, like, a reason to want the abolishment of the state. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's like, oh, he's just driven by resentment. Like, it's there's always this drive to make sure that they don't have any really legitimate grievances, that they're always hypocrites or, like, somehow, yeah, abusing power or whatever. Like, it's... And that's a riot. It's a neoliberalism thing, but it's riot um, are like that. Anyway, Salticus said, Jace, me and my family are simple people. Also, Jace, in our factory. Yeah, <laughs> like that's the other thing is like Jace is there talking about, oh, no one expected very much of me. I'm just a simple boy from a humble background with my family who own a hammer factory, which is like, OK, that's nice. Uh, but people in Zon live on the street and die in poison swamps. But good for you, Mr. Working Class. Remember, drinking tea, protect the voice, mate. Yes. Nightpunk. It's a two-way street, but they're both going one way. <laughs> yeah. I, I assume that's in in, in reference to the thing I said about... Yeah. Uh, Torch1028. Sawn should just pull itself up by its bootstraps. I love that saying. Do you know why I love the saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps? It's because it used to be, once upon a time... Pull yourself up by your bootstraps used to be an absurdism. It used to be a thing that you said that was like, oh, like you, your leg is broken. Well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps because you're wearing your boots. It was meant. It was meant to be a thing of like, oh, it's like you should just do the impossible. Then it was meant to be sarcastic, but now it's not sarcastic anymore, and it's terrible. Um, Derek Casagrande is sending this because I need to leave soon. When Vi has Caitlyn up against the wall, Vi takes a deep breath like she's working up the courage to do something. Then Pim walks by and the plot takes over. Yeah, I mean, they... they, they <laughs> Caitlyn and Vi are not being subtle. At all about how gay they are. Let's see. Do you think that when Mel notes his absence, that is showing that she may have gotten attached to Jace? Or is it simply to show Jace's regret of abandoning Victor that Jace would never leave her for him? Yeah, I mean, Mel has caught feelings for Jace, I think. Um, could you talk about the possible Noxus cameo in the next act with Mel's mother? Oh, no, no, it's not going to be a cameo. Noxus is going to show up. Like, that's... we've I've, I've seen the trailer for Act 3. Um, and Noxus is showing up because Mel's family is from Noxus, and her mother shows up, and she brings soldiers. So, you know, Noxus is going to show up. <laughs> anyway... Let's move on to talking about Mel. Since we've talked about Jace, we'll get to Victor, but let's talk about Mel. So, Mel's introduction scene, right? Like, the first time we see her at all, the very first thing she says, like, she gets this note from her assistants, like, um... The House Pharaoh sent you a note and wishes to remind you that it's thanks to their innovations that you are now the richest woman in Piltover, or person in Piltover, actually. And the first thing that Mel says in response to being the richest person in all of rich person town, like the richest of the rich people in the rich in, in the rich town, is still I'm the poorest Madonna. I need something more. I need something revolutionary. Like, that's the first thing she says is like in response to being the Jeff Bezos of Piltover is like, I need more though. Like, it's not enough. I need more. I need to be richer. I need to be even richer than I already am, even though I am the richest rich person. Um, and that's that's Mel. Um, like, that's her motivation. And the reason why she is this way, this is something she like she talks to Jace about it, like in a vulnerable moment when she's actually letting herself be a little vulnerable with him, is that she's the fuck up of her family. Like that she's the disappointment of the Madarda clan. That 
she has never in her life felt good enough for her family. She's never felt good enough for her mother. And so part of what Mel is doing, like the reason why being the richest person in Piltover isn't enough for her is because like she needs, she has this emotional need to beat her family and to earn their respect. And in that sense, there is a parallel between Mel and Jinx. Um, in that they both have this this feeling of this this inferiority complex, this feeling that they're not good enough, that they're not doing enough, that they're not that they're not worth enough, that they both struggle with, um, which I think is interesting, is because it's again it's it's sort of similar to the parallel between Jace and Vi, where they both have this protector complex, like they have this feeling like it, we need to protect everyone around us, we need to protect people, which Jace got from his mother, like um, from seeing his mother almost. I that's why he's so obsessed with doing. Hex exciting. He wants to protect people. He wa he's desperate to make things better, in the same way that Vi is. Um, and so that's the reason why Mel is the way that she is. Again, it's not she's not a, a mustache twirling cartoon villain. She's just like she has this thing that makes her do the way that she does. And so, having been raised by this very cutthroat Noxian noble house, and made her way to Piltover to make her own fortune. That's the kind of personality that she takes with her. And that's how she conducts all of her relationships, right? Um, all of her relationships are ultimately about furthering herself, like getting further on ahead, um, like making more profit for herself, like getting more respect, getting more power for herself, because that's that's what that's her emotional need. And so that's her first interaction with with Jace is that oh, I can use this kid. Um, like, I can use him, I can get something out of him that I need, um, and that's why she takes an interest in him. Like, when he becomes the golden boy of Piltover, it's like, right, like, Mel decides that she needs to get an in with him because she needs him to advance her position. I think, though, that it's not just that. Like, I think Mel genuinely has feelings for Jace because he is such an honest little goody two-shoes. Like, he is... Unlike Mel and her entire family and everyone she has ever met, Jace is actually kind of a nice person. Like, he's egotistical, but he's nice. Like, he genuinely cares about making the world a better place. He genuinely cares about her feelings. He genuinely he genuinely likes her. Like, for real, he likes her. And I think she does catch some feelings for him. Yeah, she was really shocked when he laid his head on her lap. He, She was shocked when Jace actually trusts her and when he actually, like, because she's been trying to teach him, right? She's been trying to tell him all the time, this is all a game, everything's about power, like, it's it's all about, like, like lying to get ahead and get what you want, and yet he decides to trust her, and that's like, she doesn't really know how to deal with that. Um. So, like, I think she's caught some feelings for him, not enough that I think she won't betray him, but I think she has caught some feelings for him that is going to sort of, sort of make her doubt. Like, her arc is probably going to be one of, like, doubting, is this really worth it? Like, what, what the hell am I doing here? Like, I think that's kind of where that bit is going. Um. Yeah, I think she's fond of him like anyone can get attached to a puppy. Yeah. Like, that's a little bit, that's a little bit what it is. Um, the relationship that they have. Um, because, like, Mel... Like, Mel doesn't really know how to deal with, and that's actually as uh, as Bruno Mor Morsaletta brings up in chat, she doesn't know how to deal with someone who trusts her. Like, she doesn't know how to deal with it because she's been going around in these political circles all her life where everything is a game about power, and then all of a sudden she meets someone who actually is, like, a genuinely good person, and she's not... My sense of her is that she's not 100% sure how to deal with that emotionally. And that's going to come up in Act 3. Like, I think... I think her arc is going to be that she eventually defies her mother and goes, no, actually, may maybe we should, like, maybe maybe I care a little bit about this shit. Like, maybe I actually care. Maybe it actually matters to me. Maybe I'm not quite as cold as I think I am. Um, that's why I think their arc is going. Oh, uh, there's a couple of, there's a super chat there. Uh, Les Flick, thank you very much. Just watched all six episodes again with your commentary on the second channel, and I really enjoyed it. Excited to hear more great points from you before the finale. Thanks for doing all this. Yes. Um, I should bring that up. There's a link to the Discord that I've pinned in the chat. And, um, once the episodes drop in, what, 11 hours? Or so? Um, we're gonna do a live, well, not a live stream, but in the Discord, there is a chat room where we will sit and we'll watch the Arcane series. And I'll record my commentary live, so you can all listen to me doing the commentary that I, that I put in the second channel. 
Um, and everyone just hangs out and chat and freaks out about the same things, and it's fun. It's it's a lot of good fun. So if you want to do that, you can join the Discord and head into the watch party room. Uh, make sure to re read the rules and everything, but you can do that. That's why that link is there. So if you want to watch the finale live with me, that's an option for you. Anyway. Let's talk Victor. So... Victor is, again, um, like, again, he's meant to be a contrast to Jace, right? Like, they're meant to be contrasts with each other. He's this crippled boy from the Undercity, this little kid who worked his way up from nothing in order to, like, gain a prestigious position in the Academy as Heimerdinger's assistant, and also, like, an, an ambitious scientist who cares deeply about, like, just like Jace, like, that's the thing, that's the way that they're very alike, is that they both care deeply about making the world a better place with technology. For Victor, this is a different thing than it is for Jace, though. For Jace, this is very personal, right? Like, Jace, for Jace, it's very like, I, my mother almost died once upon a time, but magic saved her. Therefore, let's do magic so that we can make the world better for everyone. Like, that's where Jace is coming from. Where Victor is coming from is that he has experienced what it's like to be down and out, like to be at the bottom rung of society. He has experienced what it's like to be the lowest in society. And that's like, he's also he's also disabled. Like he has a disability that has made the world and his life even more challenging for him. So he comes at it less from a thing of like, of like um, a, a particular trauma with his mother and more from a perspective of like, he knows what it's like to be the lowest of the low, to be the most miserable of all. He knows what it's like physically on his own body. Like, and I think that's that's where part of his obsession with technology comes from. We get these flashbacks in the second act, right? Like, where we see Victor as a child, where he builds this little mechanical ship, right? And he puts it in the water, and it starts going, and you see him running, like, he's, he, he's trying to keep up with it, but his body just can't keep up with technology right? Like, his body just can't keep up with his little things, and he's constantly trying to push himself further, but he literally can't. His body just isn't up to the task. Um, and that sort of accentuates his relationship with with technology. Is It's this thing that allows you to go further than what your weak and frail human body can do without technology, right? Um... So for him, he has this very emotional relationship with technology that, like, it's what allows you to transcend your limits as a person. Um, oh, the accent, right. Okay, let's talk about accents in League of Legends. Th they make no fucking sense. That's it. Like, that's accents in League of Legends. There's no, like, there's no geographic... Accents are not tied to geography. They're not tied to culture. They're just, like, characters have accents, which is why when you go to Demacia, like, you'll hear people talking in, like, a British accent, and you'll hear, like, American accents and Scottish accents. And when you're in Zaun, or rather when you're in Noxus, right, you get Swain, who speaks with a sort of patrician. Like, sort of that, that, kind, of, that kind of talk. And you get Draven, who talks like a wrestler. Like, you get that, and you get, like, Fiora talking. Yeah, Fiora who is completely French, and in Noxus you also get the Vladimir, who talks like this, Hello, my darlings. Like, he, he has that. Like, it's just, accents make no sense. Uh, in the Freljord, you have Brom, who speaks a slow combination of Russian and perhaps Swedish. Um, but you also have Ash, who's just an American. And you have, and you have Lysandra, who speaks with, like, a sort of, 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 um, of, like, sort of British accent, right? Um... So accents in League of Legends doesn't make any fucking sense. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> absolutely don't worry about it. They don't make any sense. So Victor from Undercity has a slightly Russian accent. Well, it's, it just happens, you know. Um, so, like, so don't worry about it. Like, the reason why Victor has a Russian accent is because he's named Victor. Like, that's it. And because... Like, once upon a time, when he was first released into the game, he was meant to be, like, a mad scientist character. So, join the glorious evolution. Like, he was meant to talk like a Russian revolutionary, except also a mad scientist at the same time. That's why. Um, so, yeah, accents. Anyway, Victor has a very close, like, personal emotional relationship with technology as a means to transcend, like, the limitations of your condition. Right? And that's his relationship with Singed as well, is about that. Like, where Singed, the lesson that he learns from Singed is this, this, like, 
the lesson that he doesn't want to learn from Singed, rather, is this, like, this highly utilitarian, very sort of dispassionate approach to the necessities of technology, right? Um... Where like so, where like Singed's argument is that sometimes you do terrible things in the name of the greater good. The mutation must survive, as Dan Dragon points out in chat. The mutation must survive because, like, it's necessary for the work. It's necessary for the job. Victor eventually comes to understand this, and that's what's gonna be, like, that's what's gonna inform him as he becomes like this science radical, like as he becomes more and more radical in his embrace of Hextech and technology in defiance of Heimerdinger. Um, so the relationship between Victor and Jace is that they are gay and they are boyfriends and they kiss each other on the mouth all the time. That's that's just what they spend their time doing when they're not doing science. They just kiss each other on the mouth the whole time and say, hello, I am I am your boyfriend. And yes, hello, you are my boyfriend. That's all they do. That's, that's what they spend their entire lives doing uh, until Mel ruins it all by being evil and seducing Jace. No, no, that is not. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that's not uh, that is not facts. And Jace is not seduced by Mel. He he. He goes along with it, and he's attracted to her from the moment that they meet. I'm sorry, he just is. What also is true, though, is that Jace and Victor have a close, intimate, emotional relationship. Right? They have a close, intimate, emotional relationship. They care very deeply for each other, and they are very important to one another. And my read on their relationship is that Jace is a bisexual disaster himbo idiot, and that Victor is probably some stripe of ace or a... Uh, something along those lines. Um, sort of, which is stereotypical, but like in terms of the way that the characters are played, um, that's, so, that's sort of the way it goes. And my read on their relationship is that they have this very close emotional relationship, this friendship that very easily could progress to romance like it could progress to romance but it won't not because neither of them could possibly be attracted to each other but because like they are so fucking deep in their work like victor is so married to hextech like he's so married to the work to the science that he he doesn't really think about having relationships outside of he doesn't know how to and jace for his part he just isn't really capable of seeing victor as as like again because they're science partners he's not really capable of seeing victor that way and victor will never push past jace's obliviousness like remember the relationship with mel and and, and jace is Mel has to push all the time. And when they finally make out, Mel is the one who takes the initiative. Like, Mel is the one who actually pushes it to go there. Because Jace would never do it. Like, he would never figure it out himself. Like, oh, actually, this woman, like, wants to get in your pants. Similarly, if Victor is just pining for Jace, like, if, they, if, if he's not saying anything, if he's not pushing anything, Jace will never figure it out. Never. Not even, like, he will never figure it out. He will never understand that this could go any further, right? So it's not that that they, it's not that their relationship is romantic. It's that it could be romantic if either of them were capable of pushing their relationship in that direction. Victor won't because he's so focused on the work and he, like, he's, he's, he's ignoring his feelings completely and he's completely focused on the work because he thinks that's the only thing that matters. Like, he thinks doing the work is the thing that's important. And Jace won't because he doesn't know how the fuck to initiate. Like, he wouldn't know how to. Like, even if he if he caught feelings for Victor, he'd be like, uh, and just blunder along like the idiot himbo that he is forever. And the way that their relationship is queer coded, because it is, like, there is queer coding in their relationship, is in that close physical intimacy that they have. Like, they're all, like, Jace especially is always touching Victor, always, like, putting his arms around him, always, like, trying to be, like, trying to physically pull him along and, like, and, like, be in his space and be with him. And Victor, for his part, like, the scene in the hallway when they're trying to break into Heimerdinger's lab and Jace, like, after Mel sort of, like, uh, like, gives them a pass and says, okay, you have one night. Jace looks at Mel and, like, obviously, like, oh my god, this lady is so fucking hot and she's so cool. And the side eye he gets from Victor, like, just the side eye he gets from Victor 
my god. Like, the gay vibes coming off of that. Like, again, if if you're very straight, if you've never really interacted with queer culture, if ne you've never really interacted with queer coding, you're not going to see it. Like, you're just going to miss that. That's not even going to register for you a little bit. But if you know what to look for, like, if, if you know what to look for, yeah, it's like, mm, that's, that's a jealous boyfriend. Like, that's jealous boyfriend vibes. Um... Yeah, also, like, Vic like, Victor's first impulse upon being caught by Mel in a hallway trying to open a door is to go, Oh, no, this isn't my bedroom. I was bringing this man to my bedroom. Yeah, <laughs> that's, like, that's his first impulse. Again, and this is where I need to make a video about this, apparently, because there's a lot of people who don't really understand. Queer coding, right, is the act of giving queer vibes in a story between characters or from a character, queer coding is the act of vibes, right? It's not confirmed. Like, if it was confirmed, then it wouldn't be queer coded, it would just be queer. Queer coding is when a piece of work has vibes. Vibes that especially queer people can pick up on, that go, oh, hey, that's, mm, okay, I know what that is. I know that vibe. That vibe is the same vibe that I know. Um, but queer coding is never confirmed. Right? It's never confirmed because it's about plausible deniability. Um, oh, shut up, Darunt. Like, learn to have some fun in your life, you killjoy. <sighs> Stop gayifying. I seem to be. It seems to be necessary to ban a few people from chat. Fuck off. Stop gayifying the series. Grow a fucking spine and have some fun in your life, you piece of shit. I'm tired of it. Like, I'm very Sorry, I have no patience for that tonight. I have no patience for that tonight. Like, that whole thing of like, Why does everything have to be gay? Why does it have to be gay all the time? Why does it always have to be romantic all the time? Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Like, I'm, I'm not interested in talking to you. I'm not interested in listening to you. Because I've heard that shit 400 million billion times. And it is always, always with the gay relationships. Every time. Every time, it's always the gay relationships. You never fucking hear that with the straight relationships. When I did a video on the relationship between Garen and Katarina, not a one fucking person, not a one fucking person left a comment under that video saying, oh, why does it have to be romantic all the time? Why does it always have to be sexual? Not a one person. It's under, every time it's Twisted Fate and Graves, it's Jason Victor, it is Caitlin and Vi, it's all the gay relationships, every single fucking one. So, like, no, I'm not listening to this shit tonight. I'm sorry, that argument is in bad faith. I have no reason to believe that you would ever say that about a straight relationship, that you would ever feel. Because, like, if you are straight and you're listening to this and you're like, but, it, but it's always gay, like, people are always talking about it's gay and it's so annoying and it's all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think how a straight person, like, think how a gay person feels at all the fucking straightness that's all around. The like, I saw a fucking on Facebook a couple who posted a picture, right? It was a baby announcement that they had where it said, like, I am, like, uh, this turkey has been stuffed, and then the man had a shirt that says, I provided the stocking. This was a straight couple that stood there with shirts that said, I have been cummed inside, and the man with a shirt that says, I came inside her, right? And to straight people, that shit doesn't register. Like, I know that it doesn't, because, like, it didn't used to register to me at all. Like, it didn't register. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, it's just they just joking about how they've been fucking and coming inside of each other and making each other pregnant. Um, that doesn't register because that's just normal. It's trashy and it's kind of it's kind of stupid and dumb, but it's normal. No one cares. It doesn't matter. If two gay people were walking around with a shirt, like, with a, like a dude and another dude was, like, with shirts that said, like, I, I've been coming inside of my boyfriend over here, people would freak the fuck out because that registers as so much worse and so much more base and ugly and, like, oh, that's so sexual and that's so pornographic. Ugh. Like, and that's not because there's any different in the semantic content of what it says. It's because there's a difference in who is saying it about whom. Straight people can talk about coming inside of each other all day long and no one bats an eyelash. Gay people so much as bring that up even a little bit that they have sex, that they enjoy sex, that there is bodily fluids involved, and all of a sudden it's pornographic. Like, I'm sorry. I just, I cannot listen to this shit anymore. And it's not... If it had only been the people in chat right now, I wouldn't have cared. Like, I wouldn't have gone off like this at all, but it has been every time. 
every time I've made a video about queer relationships. Every time. Every goddamn time. And it's been hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. So I'm tired. And I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. So, listen. Jason and Victor don't have to be gay. At all. They are queer. There's queer coding in their relationship. I will maintain that that is a valid reading of their relationship. But they are not explicitly queer. Jace is explicitly, at the very least, bisexual, but he's explicitly interested romantically in women, and Victor explicitly is inter romantically interested in no one. They don't have to be queer. The same thing goes, unfortunately, for Caitlyn and Vi. They're queer-coded, and they're very queer-coded, and it's very obvious that they're flirting, but also, they don't have to be, because it's not been confirmed. It's coded, it's not confirmed, and if you don't like it, and if you don't want it to be romantic, just pretend that it's not just just be like okay i have decided that in my reading of the story they're not you're allowed to do that gay people claiming these things and saying fuck yeah these guys are fucking these girls are definitely in lesbians with each other it's not a threat gay romance by the way this is the thing that pisses me off i'm i'm still gonna rant sorry you set me off so here we go it's your fault gay romance is not a threat to same-sex friendships. This is the one that really pisses me off, right? Every time I like I, I bring up queer male relationships in any videos ever, someone says, oh God, can't guys just be friends anymore? I think male friendships are way more beautiful and way more pure than these disgust, like these base sort of erotic sexual relationships. Oh, like why does it always have to be, why can't it just be friendship? Why do you think friendship and, and sexuality are opposites. Why do you think that friendships and romantic relationships are opposites? Why do you think that? And more to the point, why do you think that gay romantic relationships are the opposites of friendship? Why do you think that if two gay men are in love with each other and that they have a romantic relationship or any kind of queer man, why do you think that means they don't have a friendship? Why is it that if they are in love with each other and they're men, all of a sudden, oh, no male friendship here. No, that's not a male friendship. That's not a male friendship. That's not representation of male friendship at all. Why do you think that gay male friendships aren't real? Because that's what it is. Like when you say like, oh, why can't they just be friends? How about both? H how about they are both lovers and they are also friends because they like each other? I don't know about you, but that's normal in my relationships. When I've had relationships, I have been good friends with the people I have been in relationships with. Did you know that? You can do that. You can have a friendship at the same time as also having a sexual or romantic relationship. These things coexist. And in fact, rather than being opposites, they are complementary. They are complementary. They build each other up. They empower each other. Romantic love empowers friendship. Friendship empowers romantic love. They work together. They're not opposites. They don't cancel each other out. One is not exclusive to the other. They go together. So, like, I, d I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't, I can't, I cannot listen to it anymore. This, this thing about, like, what about friendships? What about, what about them? They're still there. The entire Marvel Cinematic Universe has nothing but male friendships in it. Nothing but male friendships. Like, any two male characters, like, they're either enemies or they're friends. Those are the only two relationships that exist in Marvel Cinematic Canon. They're not being threatened. There is no threat to male friendship. None. Zero. None whatsoever. It's an argument in bad faith, and I'm not going to listen to it. Like, not here. You can, you can post it somewhere else. If you want, go to a men's rights forum or whatever. I don't care. I don't want it here. I'm not going to tolerate it. Anyway. Where were we? I blacked out there for a second. What was I saying? Ugh. <sighs> okay. Uh, there were some super chats. <laughs> um, so queer coding is space groove? Yeah, kind of. Like, queer coding is vibes. It's all about vibes. Uh, Keegan Vance, thank you for that super chat. Um, and Sage Delphi as well. And Lillian, thank you. And Derek Casagrande. And Summer Swirl, thank you. Uh. Anyway. Where were we? Um, right. 
the queer coding of Victor and Jesus' relationship is that, like, they have a close emotional relationship that, if you decide to read it that way, could progress to a romantic relationship. It doesn't. Doesn't necessarily have to. But they have a close emotional, like, relationship to each other. An intimate relationship to each other. That is explicitly, like, portrayed in such a way that it could progress. Even though... In this case, it's not going to happen. Like, it, Riot are not going to show canonical gay male romance on screen. It's just not going to happen, unfortunately. I wish it was, but but they choose to respect censorship laws, so, so that's not going to happen. Caitlin and Vi, on the other hand, it's a sad fact. Like, it sucks because it's, it's, it's really kind of condescending, but it's a sad fact that women-loving-women relationships... Um, are generally considered less threatening and more acceptable than male loving men relationships, unfortunately. And that comes from a long cultural history of not considering lesbian relationships as real, as relationships that involve, like, a man, which is... Um, but what that also means is that insofar as there's going to be queer representation in Arcane, Vi and Caitlyn are the best bet we got. Like... It, it's being, I, I think they're hinting at it. Like, I think they're hinting that they just might go there, maybe, but I wouldn't expect it. Like, I really, I, gen, I wouldn't expect a kiss. I wouldn't expect anything confirmed. Like, if we get anything, it's going to be on the, on the level of, like, Legend of Korra, where Asami and Korra walk hand in hand. Like, that's, that's as close as we're going to get, I think. But that like they've they've definitely been more explicit with it. Like everyone, like a lot of people did not pick up at all on the idea that there's any queer coding between Jace and Victor. Because like it's very subtle. It's not it's not very out there. It's not super explicit. Um, but everyone picked up on Caitlyn and Vi because Kate like because Vi literally like it couldn't be less subtle. Vi literally like goes over, like goes around her and looks up and down her and is like, wow, you're hot cupcake. You're really sexy. Hey, girl who I'm looking at, you're a hot girl who's hot, who's sexy. Like they couldn't possibly be any more fucking explicit about it. And we also, we like, we also get the scene where in the brothel, like Vi leaves Caitlyn behind and goes, hey, go on undercover in here. And then like she walks by like five minutes later and Caitlyn is already just sitting there flirting openly with one of the female brothel pa pa patrons. It's like, yeah, they're not being subtle about like Caitlyn and Vi, um, like the way that their relationship is meant to be read. That queer coding is very, very, very obvious and very, very, very clear. Um... And that's why people picked up on it. Like, that's queer coding that everyone can see. Whereas, Victor and Jace, it's like, it's very subtle vibes. And it's very unexplicit vibes. What else did I want to talk about? Right, Victor. Victor and Jace. So, the sex scene between Mel and Jace. The way that it's presented is that we see Victor hard at work pouring his lifeblood into Hextech. And we see Caitlyn and Mel fucking, right? Like, they're, they're, they're doing sex. And the way, like, the way that it's intercut between the two is that Jace is cheating, not on Victor, because they don't have a sexual or romantic relationship, but he's cheating on their dream. He's cheating on the Hextech dream that they otherwise had both committed to. Like, they had both committed to this dream. Caitlin, Jace, Jason, Mel, I'm all over the place. <laughs> write me that fanfic. Write me that fanfic. Um... <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Shut up, chat. I said the wrong thing one time. Don't change the group chat name. Stop it. <laughs> anyway. It's framed as Jace cheating on their relationship with Hextech. Their shared dream, right? Um, Which is like, again, the, sh the imagery of that scene is so heavy-handed. Like, it's so heavy, like, with the whole of, like, like, Jason Mel fucking and intertwining with Hextech and Victor, like, having these visions and his blood pouring in. Like, it's very, very heavy-handed, the whole of the thing. Um, but what it is, like, that scene, in terms of, of what's happening in the plot, is that Jace is cheating on 
Hextech. He's cheating on the science dream, and that's because it's part of his storyline that he's becoming more and more corrupted. He's becoming more and more corrupted by Piltover politics and becoming more and more enamored with Piltover politics. And I think I actually have a screenshot specifically uh, that demonstrates what I mean. I'm going to have to find it, though, and I have like 4,000 billion of them. It's not a sex scene screenshot, don't worry. Um, so just give me a sec here. Uh, it's one of the newer ones near the beginning. Let's see. It's specifically the shot where... Victor's working on the science, uh... Okay, here it is. Let me just click the thing so you can see. Nope, that's the wrong one. Put my notes away. Put this one up there, and... Boom. There it is. Uh, I'll just get myself out of the way. Just a sec. Poof. It's this shot, specifically. Right? This is... This is a shot, um where Jace and Victor are still, they're working on Hextech, right? And Jace is working on his big speech that he's going to present at the uh, Progress Day, blah, blah, blah. And the storytelling here tells you everything. Victor is here looking at Hextech, looking at the project, looking at the work. Jace is here looking at himself, right? Like, that's a con that's the contraposto. Uh, contraposto that's coming uh, to these two fr from these two characters is that what are they looking at and arcane is all about this arcane is all about what are characters looking at what are their eyes doing it's all about vision like that comes in like very obviously with silco he has that freaky eye that can't close because like he literally can't stop seeing his vision right like his eye literally can't close he can't look away away from from his dream, from his vision, from his whatever. Um, the opening of Arcane, the very first shot we get of Jace in like the uh, the intro of Arcane, like when when they're playing the Imagine Dragon song, is Jace looking into Hextech. And all over, over and over and over again in Arcane, characters look at things. They have vision of things. They see things. There are things that are like reflected within their eyes. Um, for example, Powder has gray eyes. When she looks at Hextech, though, she gets blue eyes. And of course, when her eyes are reflecting the flames around Vander's body at the end of episode three, they become pink, which again foreshadows what's going to happen to her when she's going to become Jinx, right? Like, so eye colors are constantly swapping and switching in the show. Um, the way that eyes look at things, characters looking at things, looking away from things, is all over the show. And here, what is being used as is like, what are these two characters looking at in this moment? Well, Victor is looking at... Hextech, he's looking at the work, which is what he's obsessed with. Jace is looking at himself. Um, he's looking at... He's looking at his own career. He's looking at his own reflection. He's looking at his own advancement. And let's get that up there and then make that go away. There we go. Right, so that's the storytelling between, between them. Like They have this relationship to Hextech that Jace is cheating on. Okay. I think it's time to get to Vi and Caitlyn. <laughs> this guy already talk- Oh, Jace blocking the victor with the coffee cup of himself. Okay, let, yeah, let's- let's. I think I have the screenshots for that one as well. Good point. Let's bring that one up. Uh, let me just find the screenshots again. Uh, why did I close the folder? Why did I do that? I should have kept them up. Because I have those screenshots as well, and they're very good. Um, because again, that's that's a great reflection of exactly what the relationship is between Jace and Victor in the show. If I can find the screenshots, uh, the thing. No, 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 no. There it is. Bonk and poof and make me go away again. There. So Jace is about to go on stage and he's about to give his big speech, right? And he tries to get Victor to go along with him. Like, he tries to get, hey, Victor, come on up. Like, this is your accomplishment, too. We're partners. And Victor's not, no, no, not in front of all these people. And and then there's this shot as, like, Jace is about to go up on stage where, like, we see Victor in the background alone in the dark, surrounded by nothingness. And Jace has this coffee cup in his hand that he puts down. And the way the shot is framed is so that it looks like that. <laughs> And it's like, it's the most heavy-handed shit you have ever seen in your life, right? Bonk. <laughs> and then, like, he just goes on stage and is like, yeah, hey, I'm fucking Steve Jobs. Woo, I'm so cool. Everything's so great. Like, again, what I'm talking about, Jace has an ego, right? 
he wanted to get Victor along with him because he has this sort of assumption in his head that Victor would enjoy it as much as he does. But Victor doesn't enjoy it. This is not where Victor lives. Jace, on the other hand, oh, my boy loves the spotlight. Oh, he, he just he's just having a great time up there. He's just eating that shit up. He's enjoying himself like a motherfucker. And it's not that he's trying to take credit away from Victor. It's not that he's trying to push Victor into the background. It's that Victor pushes himself into the background and Jace doesn't really do anything to pull him out of there. Right? Jace is like, oh, you don't want the spotlight? Okay, I'll take it. Um, And so this is very, very extremely, just the most literal imagery you could possibly imagine of Victor literally being eclipsed by Jace's merchandise. His merchandise. Oh, is the Discord link not working? Is it? God damn it, did it expire? Hang on. Is the Discord link still working? Uh, could someone check it for me? Just need to make sure that it's... Uh... It's working. Okay, it's good, 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 good. But yeah, like, this is very literal imagery about their relationship. Like, it's not that Jace is trying to take credit. It's that when Jace is given credit, he's happy to have it. Like, he's, he's he doesn't say no. He just, he doesn't say no, because why would he? He doesn't think he should. Um, and that's a very, like, that's a very good re representation of the way that their relationship works. Anyway, Vi and Caitlin. <laughs> so... I mean, lesbians, obviously. Like, uh, <laughs> like, unlike Jason Victor, the show is not subtle about Vi and Caitlyn. Um, and the way that they are very flirty with... Well, no, not so much. Caitlyn isn't that flirty with Vi, but Vi is very flirty with Caitlyn. Um, which, like, you can read it... You can read it as explicit flirting. You can just read it as Vi messing with Caitlyn, if you want to. Again, like, if... Again, just, just as queer people are free to read any character that they want as gay, you can just... If, if it bothers you, you can just not do that. You can just be like, nah, I don't think so. Like, you, just, you can just be like, nah, I don't think so, and leave it alone. You can just you can just mind your business. You can just do that. You can just do that. Um, but Caitlyn specifically, right? Like, the way that she's coded, and this is the where the more subtle queer coding of Caitlyn comes in, where I think, like, they've really gone hard, especially on Caitlyn, on the queer coding which is that she is this aristocratic girl who's raised very much in privilege and raised in money and raised in a way that like, she's encouraged to see herself as separate from Piltover and Zaun, separate from the common people, as someone who's like, who's like, uh, who's more worthy of being protected, who's more worthy of the resources and the advantages that she has by virtue of her birth. Like her parents are constantly encouraging her to see herself as separate and different from people in Zaun. Caitlyn, to her credit, doesn't do that. Caitlyn instead becomes this very headstrong, very idealistic woman who's like, no, like these are also people, like these are also people, like they also deserve protection. I should also be out there investigating. I should be out there doing good for the world and doing good for the city. Now she comes from a position of ignorance and privilege. She does not understand Zon in the least because she's never been allowed to. She's never been allowed to go there or talk to anyone or meet anyone from Zon. She's she's so sh yeah, like as as a little Lucas in chat says, she's sheltered border bordering on ignorance, like massively. She has no fucking idea what Zaun is like. She has no idea why people in Zaun, like, ap like resent Piltover the way that they do. And so she's a very idealistic person um, in that sense. And her relationship with Vi is, like, the queer coding is so... And I don't know, like, if, if, you, if you're not used to looking for queer coding, if you haven't talked to a lot of queer people, you're probably not going to see it. But when Vi takes Caitlyn to Zaun... What it is, is this is an experienced, like, an experienced butch woman taking this sort of, of sheltered little upper-class girl to, like, an 
a nightclub in the Undercity where everyone is sort of free to be more open with themselves. And everyone, like, there's, there's like this open sexuality and sensuality where she gets to explore herself and takes her to a brothel where, like, she gets to sort of hit her. Like, the experience, and this is sort of, this is not so much a thing, a thing uh, for young queer people anymore, I think. Um, but it used to be, and this is something I know, like, my uncle has told me stories, or he did before he died, but, um, my uncle, uh, was gay, and, like, the, the way that gay culture was, and this is also something, if you watch a movie like, um, Paris is Burning, which is a great documentary about queer culture, um, in, and queer city life, because there was no, no acceptable spaces for queerness in society in most places, the experience of going to a nightclub for the first time and meeting other gay, queer people and like experiencing your your sexuality as something that is good and not like evil or perverse or wrong and being able to be free in yourself like it's such a quintessential gay experience like it's it's so it's so stereotypically a gay experience um like, so the, the whole coding of just Vi taking Caitlyn, like, to the Undercity and showing her this, like, this this different way of life and introducing her to this thing and Caitlyn taking to it so quickly, like, like, clearly enjoying it, it's, like, that, more than the obvious flirting, more than, like, Vi calling her cupcake and, like, telling her that she's hot and whatever, more than that, that queer coding is just, like, that, that is so heavy. Like, that is so heavily slathered in, like, gay stereotypes that, like, that's the thing that makes me think that maybe they'll actually go there. Like, maybe they'll actually go there because, like, they, like they're driving at it really, 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 really hard. Like, just really hard that what's happening in this scene is an experienced queer woman taking this, this little baby gay to her first club experience. Like, that's, that's what's happening there. <laughs> Like that's what's happening there is like like and and also it's also like the coding like because queerness has a long association with sex work which is like queerness is not inherently sexual like not all queer people are sexual people at all not all queer love is sexual um but like but like queerness and and sex workers have been marginalized in many of the same ways there's been a lot of solidarity between those communities and so like again that that association between being taken to a brothel like because it used to be and again this is like this is like ancient queer history but it used to be that literally like the only place that that men could go to have sex with other men were places where sex work were conducted like that used to that used to be the case because like it was it was the only place that was that was safe well, not even really safe, but it was the safest place available where you could go and meet other people who were queer like you was in sex work circles. Like, again, like the whole, the fact that Vi takes the Caitlyn to a brothel also, like, it's again, it's not explicit, it's vibes, but the vibes are so strong! <laughs> but yeah. Very heavily queer coded. And the thing is, Caitlyn doesn't reject it ever. That's the other thing is like Caitlyn, when Vi flirts with her, Caitlyn is flustered. She's like flustered like a schoolgirl. Um, but she never rejects it. She's never like, yeah, like she never feels like it's gross or anything. She's just like, whoa, I did not expect this. She's just surprised by it. Um, it's the other thing. And the scene um, where Caitlyn and Vi are in like the lowest part of the Undercity in like the old home that uh, Vi and Powder grew up in, and Caitlyn is feeding Vi the medicine. Like, there's no, there's no sense at all that Caitlyn feels any need to have, like, personal space between them. Again, vibes, just vibes, but the vibes are like, he like holding her face so close. It's shot, that's the thing about that scene where Caitlyn is like holding Vi's face, it's shot like a kiss. Like the, 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 the way the camera treats that scene is it's a it's a close up it's a zoom in it's a very intimate shot and it's framed like a kiss it's not a kiss but it's framed like one like it's so heavy like the coating is so heavy <laughs> it's it's maddening but yeah besides that let's talk about outside of the gay stuff let's that's the we've we've been in the gay stuff for a while now let's move on for a second outside of that 
Caitlyn is also a uh, like uh, a character who's sort of meant to bridge the divide. She's meant she's the Piltover character who actually is willing to see Zonites as more than just criminals, like as more than, than these wild, uncontrollable, unlawful brutes, right? Like she's she's the person who has the idealism, um, who, ha who has like the idealism to to see beyond the class divide and to actually care. Um, like, uh, to actually, to actually see Zonite people as, 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 as human beings, um, which is something that's unusual, like, because most of the time, like, when you hear the council, or we hear anyone from Piltover talk about people in Zon, they talk about them like they're animals. Like, they talk about them like, oh, you people down here, like, like, you're all just, blah, like, like, Marcus does it very explicitly in his scene, like, where he shouts at them like they're, like they're savages, um, but the council also, they're talking about, oh, well, the Undercity cannot be controlled by us. Oh, they're wild, like they're uncontrollable and, they, and they're like, they're dangerous and they're, they're this, this hostile other that the Undercity, like the Undercity is this enemy to Piltover. Caitlyn is the first, like is, is the Piltover character who is able to see Zonites as people. And it takes, like she's, she comes from it, added from a perspective of complete ignorance. Like she doesn't know what the hell, um, what the hell she's like what the hell she's talking about down there but she's someone who's willing to see them as human beings um and we see that especially in the scene where she is getting medicine for why and like the little the little nervous guy who um who betrays her ultimately like she hugs him like completely without compunction like when he helps her she just goes in for a hug and like thank you like she shows him physical compassion and like touch is a big deal like the the fact that she's willing to touch him and like I like have physical contact with him that that's the thing that shows that like she's capable that she's capable of bridging that divide she's capable of not dehumanizing them of seeing them as human beings that matter right um she has a lot of ignorance she has a lot of stuff that she needs to unlearn but that's where she's being positioned in the show as the person who's capable right of seeing past the class divide and that compassion is, is portrayed as highly necessary um because that's the thing that nobody else really has like even jace um like he he's not like he's not actively hostile to zon as such but he's like he still comes at it from that piltover perspective right um so that compassion is interesting and that's the thing that that's the thing like caitlin is a cop obviously she's part of the enforcers and the enforcers are like this like this brutal violent occupying army and zon like just like there's this scene early in the show right like where where the the, the enforcers are looking for the kids they're looking for powder and and vi and the gang and they are talking to this guy on the street, right? Like, who's being rude to them. Like, he's being very rude. He's like, I'm not, I don't gotta tell you goddamn shit. Like, I'm, topside is none of my fucking business. And then he spits on one of the cops' shoe, right? He spits on one of their shoes. And that's very rude. Like, that's a very, that's a very disrespectful thing to do to someone. But then the cops throw him through a window. They pick him up physically and they throw him through a window. That is attempted murder. That is attempted murder. Like that that's a potentially lethal thing to because he was rude to them. They threw him through a window. And consistently the cops uh, the enforcers in Zon are portrayed in these terms. They are wearing these stormtrooper masks. Like they have these, these, these like death masks on. They pick people up by their necks. They throw people through windows. They brutalize people. And when the kids are fleeing, when the kids, the children are fleeing from the cops, one of them pulls out a fucking gun and is about to shoot Vi. Because like, well, they're running away. So I guess I can just murder these children. That's fine. Um. So the show is very, very clear about, like, why does Son ha hate the Enforcers? Yeah, you know, because... Because uh, <laughs> fucking obviously. Um, like, it's, it's, it's not ambiguous at all why Zonites hate the cops. And it's, it's justified. Like, it's, it's plainly justified. And Caitlyn is still part of the Enforcers, right? 
And that's one of the things I worry about with the show is that they're sort of going to try and go, oh, well, I mean, there's just a few bad apples. And like, if just the right people are in charge, then the enforcers can be good for, for Zon. It'll be good to have them in Zon, actually, which is like... <sighs> <laughs> Those children seemingly performed an act of terror. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Frank, no, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Like, you, no, 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 you can't come into my chat and say like, well, but there's a, possibly a justification for cops killing children. No, there's not. No, there isn't. There isn't. There isn't. There isn't one. And if you think there are, you're a fucking moron. Like, you're just a dumbass. You you are, like, pl please become smarter. Because no, there isn't. No, there isn't. I don't care what argument you're making up in your head right now. No, there isn't. What if a child has a gun? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. That thing you're thinking about? No. No, there isn't. Nope. Wrong. Wrong. And, like, my personal opinion is that the state should never kill its citizens, ever. Like, the state doesn't have a right to kill its citizens, ever. But, like, cops should not murder children. That one, I feel like that's an uncontroversial position. Like, cops should not kill children. Like, just, I don't know, is that a hot take? Just, just saying cops shouldn't kill children. Just saying, like, that's my, that's, like, I, it's, it's a... It's a it's a very controversial position. It's 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 a spicy hot take, but it's one I'm willing to go down with a ship on. Anyway, where were we? Right. So my worry is that like instead of really facing up to like what it means when the state employs massive brutality against its citizenry, um like instead of really facing up to that. I'm worried that the show is just kind of going to go, oh, well, it's because the wrong people were in charge. Like, it's because there were some bad counselors and Silco and Marcus, and they were the bad people, but if we put the good people in charge, then the system is good. Because it's like, it's, um, it's not really that simple to fix these things. Um, it's not really that simple to fix these things. It, it really isn't, and I, I dislike it when shows sort of present this highly simplified reality where it's just like, Oh, well, just put the right people in charge, and then the system will be good. Rather than, hey, maybe the system itself needs, like, fundamental reformation. Like, maybe instead of Piltover sending a bunch of enforcers down there, what if Zonites, and I'm just spitballing here, I don't know, got to vote on how they wanted their community to be policed? Like, what if the people who live there got to actually vote on what, what kind of law enforcement that they wanted to have? What if that? What if, what if there was some kind of... I don't know, democracy. I'm just... Democracy. It's this crazy idea I've had in my head of, like, democratic control of your own community and how it's policed. That would be interesting. Uh, that might that might be an idea. Um, but, like, but the broader point being, like, if what if Zon actually got to decide whether they wanted to have enforcers on their streets? Like, what if Zonites, if they asked them, Hey, would you like to have enforcers on your streets enforcing the law, or would you like to not have that, and then respect whatever decision that was made? Like, just, just saying. Um, you know, and again, that comes back to the problem with Silco, right? Like, Silco is this guy, we're gonna have the glorious nation of Zaun, and then respect from Piltover, and blah, blah, blah. Where, again, like, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean... Piltover will no longer have the legal authority to enforce their laws in Zon, and thus, like, no more Piltover enforcers in Zon. Is that what it means? I again, it's a thing of like this story is highly political. Like, it's it's grounded in police violence, in poverty, in rapid industrialization. It's grounded in pollution. It's grounded in wealth gap politics. It's grounded in, like, a sort of uh, late Victorian, early Edwardian, uh, or, yeah, Edwardian Victorian, sort of late stage British Empire industrialization aesthetic of, like, like, what it was like to live in the early days of industrialization with, like, massive pollution and absolutely horrible health outcomes. Like, that's where the show is grounded in these politics. And these politics are key to the story. They're key to the story.
JS137. Killing kids is bad, obviously. What if killing uh, killing a threat is the only way to save lives and that, that threat is a kid? I don't know why you're so eager to make up fictional scenarios in your head where killing children is all right, but you should probably stop doing that. I don't think it's very healthy. Like, you, people make up all these sort of fictional scenarios. Like, what if, what if, what if a child was a bomb and that bomb was a nuclear bomb and that bomb was going to go off and kill 50 million people? Then would it be okay to shoot the child? No, shut up. Kindly stop. Just stop. Just stop. Because if you're making up that scenario in order to justify the theoretical idea of murdering children, you're, you're, you're using your moral reasoning for the wrong purposes. Like, don't... Don't spend your time trying to come up with fictional scenarios in which committing horrible crimes are okay. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Instead, maybe try and use your brain to think about real things that actually happen and ways to make the world a better place instead of ways to justify doing atrocities. Just, I, I'm sorry to preach at you, but like you're in my chat making up fictional scenarios in which it's okay to kill a child, so... So I'm gonna preach at you a little bit, because that's a weird fucking thing to do. It's a very weird thing to do. <laughs> if you're arguing that killing children is always wrong, would that not be a con- I wasn't arguing that killing children was always wrong, Joshua C. I was saying the police shouldn't murder children. I wasn't making a hypothetical argument about whether it could ever conceivably under any circumstances if you imagined any possible or impossible condition where magic happens or whatever would it then be morally okay to murder children because i think that's a stupid argument to have i was saying actual human police officers should not murder children that's a thing that shouldn't happen and that's not the same fucking argument so quit it Like, you sit there inventing trolley problems, and trolley problems aren't real. Like, if you pull the lever, ten people die, but if you don't pull the lever, one person die. Do you pull the lever? That's a- that's- Those are thought experiments, and I'm not talking about thought experiments here. Anyway, stop talking about killing children in my chat, please. I took Huck, uh, Brian Jones sent a super chat, I took Huck and the other shimmer addicts as analogs to people suffering from leprosy, which I think makes Caitlyn embrace of him even more meaningful. Yeah, it's something along those lines, like, well, mm, the thing is, like, they don't have to be analogs for people suffering from leprosy. They just have to be analogs for people suffering from drug addiction, because, because people with drug addiction are treated the same way, like, like, people with drug addiction are treated as these gross, disgusting, sort of, filthy creatures that should never be touched. Um, and, like, so so I don't think they need to be necessarily metaphors for leprosy. I just, they're just metaphors for drug users. And, like, specifically Silco, like, he's using this, his monopoly over this, uh, this drug. Like, like, Shimmer is not just, like, a narcotic. It's, it's a drug that keeps people alive. Like, when people are fucking almost dying, a little bit of shimmer can save their lives. Like, it's an incredibly powerful medicine as well. And Silco uses his monopoly over this this medicine as a means to cement his power in Zon. Right? Um, so like I don't I don't think like I think you're right. Like, absolutely, like they could be uh like like metaphors for leprosy, but also drug addiction. Like just drug addiction. Um, because like so much of, uh, like, in the U.S. right now, for example, to bring it to again to a real-world example, the um, opioid epidemic that exists in the U.S. right now, that is largely caused by, um, like, by an overprescription of opioids by doctors for people who have, like, pain, who have, like, actual pain that needs actual medical attention. They take these incredibly powerful opioids and then... Eventually, they get cut off by their doctor, and then it's like, well, now I have this massive fucking opioid addiction. What's the opioid I can get? Well, it's fentanyl and it's heroin. Right? Like, and that creates, again, that's the thing about, like, drug addiction is not just, oh, this person was mentally too weak to not take the addictive drug. Like, they were, they were seduced by pleasure or whatever. Um, it's also, like, it's a lot of people who, like, I need to take this drug to fucking live. Like, otherwise, I am in chronic pain all of the time if I don't take a painkiller. 
oh, well, I can't, aff I don't have healthcare, so I can't afford the painkiller from the doctor, or I'm being cut off by my doctor from this health, from this pain medication because the doctor thinks I don't need it anymore. Where are they gonna go? Well, they're gonna go get the painkiller where they can get it. You know? Um, and like, it's so like drug addiction is not a moral problem. Like it just isn't, it's a medical issue as it always has been. Um, and so like, and Silco in, in Arcane is, is like specifically, he's using his monopoly over this medicine that these people need in order to make their lives even rem remote, remotely bearable to control them, like to assert his power over the underground. Um, and that's again, like that's again the way that the, the show is is stepping right into the middle of real world politics. Like it's it's not even subtle. Like it's going right in the middle of real world politics, um, in a way that, like again, if they don't if they don't actually address it, if they don't actually talk about it, if they don't actually like sort of bring up that hey, like this is a real issue, um, like it's. <laughs> It feels cheap. Like it feels cheap just to sort of bring in like like things like like opioid epidemics and bring in things like massive wealth inequality and like police brutality and then not actually address it. Like not actually go there. Like not in the sense that it has to be like a long lecture on the politics of whatever, but just like that it should be something that's explicitly recognized in the text of the thing, right? Rather than just being gestured at. Like rather than just being like, oh yeah, it's this sort of thing that you know from real life, blah, blah, blah. Let's not talk about it in the specifics. Let's get back to the punching scenes. Um, like, and that's that's my worry about Arcane, as it always has been. Uh, anyway, can we talk about how Act 3 is going to be an epic League of Legends fantasy Marvel movie again? Yeah. Yeah, let, let's get back to some lighter topics, because uh, between the child murder and the drug addiction, uh, things got a little heavy over here. Um... Because that's the thing that I'm expecting from it. I'm expecting from it that um, that what we're what we're gonna get is like Silco is gonna be the villain. He's gonna be the big bad guy. He's gonna have the people in the chem tanks and Vi and Jesus gonna are gonna fight them. And at some point, I think it, what they're setting up is that Jinx is gonna do a self sacrifice play. Like I think that's how Jinx gets turned into Jinx as we know her in the game is that she. There's something happening with a big shimmer something something, and in order to destroy all of the shimmer, someone needs to blow it up or burn it or do whatever, and then, like, Vi is about to go and do it, and then Jinx is like, no, I'm gonna do it, and she's gonna do the self-sacrifice play. Like, the same, yeah, exactly the kind, the same way that Vander did. Um, she's gonna do the self-sacrifice play, and that's gonna, like, expose her to so much shimmer that it finally turns her into the jinx that we know and love um but that's gonna be how she goes like how she completely cracks um that's what i think like that's my prediction it's gonna be something like that and it's gonna be tragic and it's gonna be it's gonna hurt a lot because it's gonna be this emotional scene where she says goodbye to her sister and it's like are we still sisters yes always nothing will ever change that and then you know <sighs> It would be dope. Like, it would be very dope. It would be super fucking cool. It would rule, I think, if they do it right. If they do it, uh, if they do it right, it would rule. But it's also going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. <laughs> Nasus and Renekton all over again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a classic. It's a classic way to do it. La, 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 la. Right, the Firelight Leaders, right. Uh, that's another thing we should talk about, isn't it? It's Echo. Uh, like, I, I didn't really I didn't really catch on to it when I was watching the episodes because I was just too into it to, like, really look for it. But, like, the Firelight Leader, and we know this because of the voice actor. The voice actor for the Firelight Leader is the same as the voice actor for Echo. Same guy. Um, so it's, it, it, it's, it's Echo. Echo is who it is. Um... So we know that, and that's gonna be that's gonna be what Echo has been doing. Um, he's gonna he's have he's gonna have been fighting Silco and his drug empire. Like specifically, Echo is gonna have been fighting, um, like trying to stop Silco from smuggling in more Shimmer to the Undercity and getting more and more people addicted to it. Um, I think, and Echo, Echo hates Jinx. He hates Jinx a lot. 
like a lot, a lot, because Jinx has been murdering Echo's friends. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a conflict there because at the end of Act 2, the Firelights take Vi. And they take, they take Vi with them, presumably to their own headquarter, uh, to talk to her, I hope. And Echo is probably going to explain just how many people Jinx has been killing. And there's going to be a conflict there where Vi wants to save her sister and Echo would probably rather kill her because uh, of, like, whew. Yeah, they took Kate as well. You think Echo knows Powder became Jinx? Yeah. Yeah, he does. He knows. He knows. Unfortunately. So yeah, that's going to be Echo. Like, I think the conflict there... I don't know how Echo is going to... I don't know if Echo is going to have his Z drive. I don't know if he's going to have his Z drive yet. Um, like, maybe if he gets a hold of a Hextech crystal like Will Soda, but I don't think we're going to have time travel shenanigans at the end of the show. Like, I don't think there's going to be um, time travel shenanigans in Arcane itself. Um, like, I think, I think that's gonna come late. Like, I think maybe by the end of the show, like, he's gonna have a hold of a Hextech crystal or a Hextech gem, and then he's gonna experiment with it, and then, you know, but... I don't think he hates Jinx. Uh, if you saw, like, the scene on the airship where, he, where, like, they're trying to burn the Shimmer, and Jinx murders one of his friends right in front of her, in front of him, he goes like... <sighs> And then he tries to lunge at her and kill her, and he has to be, be dragged out of the airship by one of his companions. So, you know, like, I, th I, th I think he's pretty well... I think he's pretty well pissed at her. Um, so, yeah. Um, so that'll, that'll be Echo. I don't know what his arc is going to be, necessarily. Like, his role there seems to be... Like, he Echo seems to stand in for... like. Zon is already divided, right? Like, we have Silco, who mostly controls everything, and then we have people who don't really like Silco, don't align with him, but aren't really in open rebellion against him, and then we have the Firelights, um, who are the people who, like, resist Silco's power, and, like, resist his operations, and, like, attack his men, and try to break down their, like, break down their business. Um, that's... That's Echo. So he stands in for, like, the side of Zon that still is loyal to Vander, essentially. Like, that still that still believes in Vander and, and his vision, that still believe in a vision of Zaun that isn't ruled by, like, power the way that Silco is. Do you think Jinx can redeem herself after everything she's done? I don't care that much. Like, I'm not, I'm not really that into redemption arcs. Like, like, if they're good, they're good. Like, Zuko has a good redemption arc. But I don't really like redemption arcs for their own sake. I don't really like redemption arcs for their own sake. Like, like... They, they need to make sense for the story. Otherwise, like, who cares? Uh, I, I don't care that much if Jinx redeems, redeems herself. I care if, she t if there's an interesting story told about her. Why? Oh, here's a question. Why didn't Echo tell the Piltoven enforcers about Silco's activities? Because the sheriff of Piltover is Marcus, and Marcus works for Silco. That's why. The enforcers are corrupt. They are corrupt, 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 and the council is corrupt, and the entire power structure of Piltover is visibly, explicitly shown to be corrupt. They are corrupt. They ignore the laws. And they enrich themselves. So, that's why. <laughs> Which is another reason, by the way, why Zon's population doesn't trust the Enforcers is because they're corrupt. They're super corrupt, and they know that they're corrupt. <laughs> uh, so that's why that is. And let's talk Vander. And let's talk Warwick. So, I'm reasonably convinced that Vander is going to turn out to be Warwick. Like, the lore lines up, the story concepts line up. I am not convinced that Warwick is actually going to show up in the show. Mostly because I don't know what role Vander would play there. Like, I don't know what... Like, if, if Warwick is unleashed, and he's in the show, and he does something. Like, what is the thing that he's going to 
do. Is he going to be the one who kills Silco? Well, I don't think Silco is going to get killed. Um, like, and is him running around and being back? Like, how does that interact with Vi and Jinx's arcs? I don't know. They wouldn't even know that he's Vander. Like, they wouldn't even know that 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 that's their surrogate father. Um, so if Vander shows up as Warwick at all, I think he's going to be hanging in, in like Silco in like a singed lab. Um. Like, I think we maybe we'll see him in the background that, that, like, Singed still has his corpse or whatever. Uh, and maybe we'll get, like, a, a, a late post-credits tease or something about, like, how he's going to get turned into blah, blah, whatever. Um, but I don't think Warwick is actually going to show up as, like, a kid. I, I just don't see where he would fit in. Like, I don't see where Warwick would... I don't think he he would fit in in the story as it's written. Um, so like, I don't think he's going to be a character. I think he's going to, he's, I think he's going to be sort of present-ish. <laughs> yeah, there isn't enough time to fit Warwick into the last three episodes. There just isn't. I don't think so. Um, and that's the same reason, like, people have been talking about whether the rat in the end of episode one that gets exposed to Shimmer, whether that might be Twitch. And like, it's like, I don't see why it would be Twitch. Like, I don't know why you would have that particular rat be Twitch because it doesn't matter. The rat doesn't show up again. Like, Twitch is not a character in the show. Um, like, so, like, why, why would, why would it matter that that was Twitch? Like, and also, Twitch has no lore. Like, he has no lore. Twitch's lore can fit in two tweets. Is it even two tweets? Let me check, actually. I can check that. Um... Let me just go and copy-paste it into... God damn it. Uh, copy paste it into Twitter and see, is it two tweets or is it one tweet? I think it's two tweets. Let's see. Twitter.com. Yeah, it's two tweets. Uh, but yeah, that that's that's all of Twitch's lore is two tweets. Um, so like, Twitch has no lore, and so for that same reason, again, there's no reason to really like, why would you why would you make this his origin story? Like, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't benefit the character. It doesn't do much. Uh, so, you know, eh, I don't really care. What is his lore? His lore is that in Zon, there some this ma magic goop something something mutation blah blah, and now there's a big rat with a crossbow. That's his lore. Like, <laughs> that's it. That's all. It is. There is a there is a there's a big mutated rat in the sewers, and he has a crossbow, and that's Twitch. So, like, it, again, like, it could... You, sure, like, why not? But, like, there's no reason to do it. Like, it doesn't add anything. It doesn't do anything um, to make that Twitch. In the same, And that's the same thing I feel about, like, like, um... Uh... It's, I, I kind of feel the same way about Warwick. It's like, yes, I think that is Warwick, but I don't think it matters for Arcane that it's Warwick. I don't think it matters for Arcane that that Vander is Warwick because I don't think Warwick has a role to play in the story. Like, maybe in Season 2, if we get one, but, you know. Yeah, characters like him, Warwick, and Zack are at most going to have a reference, but they aren't relevant for the story. Yeah, like, Zack is also not going to show up. Like, he's not, he's not relevant. He's not interesting. He's not important. Um, for the purposes of Arcane. It's world building. No, it's not. Like, like I, I know what you mean, Fumak. Like, I know what you mean, like, in terms of, like, having these references and stuff, like, that would build the world a little bit, but not for Arcane. Like, because they're not part of Arcane. They're not part of Arcane's world, so if you do world building for them, but they never actually show up in the show and they don't have any actual role in the story, then it's not world building, it's just Easter eggs. Um, and that's, and that at best, that's something that, that's supposed to be there, but not be distracting. And if you spend a bunch of time on it and then you don't pay it off, then it's bad writing because that, that, that's just jerking the audience around. Do you think Camille will appear? Nope. I don't think Camille will appear. Like the Pharaoh's clan has been mentioned, but again, I don't think Camille has a role to play in the story. Like, I don't think that Camille has a thing to do that would interact with the major stories of the game. If she did, she would have had to have been introduced earlier. I think there's an outside possibility of Swain doing a cameo, 
because there is that connection with Noxus. Like specifically, like Mel is a Medarda. She's a Nox. She's from a Noxian noble house, um, and that there is this suggestion in the trailer anyway that she has like a dual loyalty kind of situation. So like, sure, maybe there's a scene in Act Three where like Swain is sitting there going, how do our plans for Piltover proceed? And she's there giving a report to Swain saying, yes, I am manipulating Piltover in order to become a Noxian colony or whatever. Um, like, that's not impossible. I don't think so, but like that might be possible because that would play a role in the narrative of Arcane, right? It would play a role in the narrative of Arcane that Mel has these divided loyalties. Urgot was Noxian. Yeah, Urgot was Noxian. He was a executioner in Noxus. And then Swain took over and was like, we don't need you anymore to execute things. So let's just send you to some chemical mines in Zaun. And then we'll never see you again. And then Urgot became a spider mech. And now he's leading an insane fascist death cult in Zaun. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Abathy Beck uh, sends a super chat saying, how do you interpret the apparent lack of colorism and homophobia in Runeterra's world? It could tie into your critique of how Riot seems to want to ignore the politically intrigue that's clearly present. Yeah, I mean, it's partly that. Um, it's partly that. It's also like Riot has made a very conscious decision, and this is something they've talked about before, that in League of Legends, there is like in the, the lore universe of League of Legends, there is no such thing as racism. There is no such thing as sexism or homophobia. Like those are just not those are just not social problems that the world experiences. And the reason they do that is because they like if they have a character in the story that's gay, they don't want to have to tell stories about how that character experiences homophobia. Like they basically have just decided that those aren't really stories that they're interested in wanting to talk about. Um and it's a little bit like, it's not like a perfect thing because like they still have um, ethnic discrimination, for example, just in Demacia, it's against mages. Like instead of skin color, it's just based on can you cast magic or not? Um, so like, so like they're still interacting with those same themes. They've just kind of, they just made, okay, it's not, it's not race based, but it's still like segregation and those same kinds of persecution just we're we're doing magic racism instead of actual racism and similarly like there have been like fiora's story for example um has very much like has these undertones of sexism to it and undertones of of homophobia to them that are sort of being played with and it's also like um magic in demacia like lux right Magic in Demacia, in a lot of the stories, especially with Lux, is coded to be sort of a code for, like, any kind of sort of inner difference from conventional society that you have to keep hidden, right? Like, Lux very much like, oh, I have to hide my light inside of myself, which is like, is a very common metaphor for some version of queerness or transness or something along those lines. It's very much sort of based around the same tropes that are used in those situations. So it's like, Riot have made a decision that, oh, there's no racism or homophobia in Runeterra, but because the real world is the real world, you kind of can't, you kind of can't get around it. Um, it's the same thing in um, Ionia, where, like, there is a very specific ethnic conflict between the Vestaya and the humans. Like, there's an, that's an ethnic conflict, and ethnic conflicts don't really exist without you have to wreck you have to reckon with the dynamics of racism somehow there like you just you just you just have to um so like riot have sort of they want to not have to tell stories that are all about homophobia racism and sexism and slavery and like, like all of those things but they also like you can't just opt out of it like it's always present like in in the stories that you want to tell you can't just opt out of it um so like this it's like a, it's it's an interesting choice, and I don't think that it's wrong necessarily to say like, hey, we want to tell stories about diverse people, but we don't necessarily want to tell stories about the worst things that happen to diverse people, like to, to people of different backgrounds and genders, and like we rather just normalize it. Um, like I think that's legit. It's just, yeah, it's not clean. Like it's not clean. It can't be clean. Uh, Chrono Mirage. Let's just use what we learned. It's a Warwick coded and Twitch coded. <laughs> 
Good play, Chrono Mirage. Good play. Okay, I don't think that music is the right vibe. That's the, that's the uh, Legends of Runeterra uh, um, pool party music, is what it is. What's my opinion on the sexualization of the underaged Jinx? Powder? Powder isn't sexualized. What are you talking about? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about there. Uh, so. Uh, Knight of Trousers, on a topic a bit less loaded, do we know anything about that robot counselor? Who, what is he? We don't know. Um, we do not know what's up with the robot counselor. We don't know what species he is. We do know, uh, like, in Zon, when the kids are going to Zon for the first time and we get, like, these crowd shots of Zon, um, there are other creatures there, like, that look a lot like him. Bulbok, yeah, um, that look a lot like him, that might be from the same species and seem to be speaking in the same language, but we don't know what's up with him. We just know that his species was nearly wiped out by the Rune Wars. That's it. Okay. Uh, what else is there? We've covered Caitlyn, we've covered Vi, we've covered... Jinx and Powder, Silco, Vander, Mel, Jace. Let's talk about Heimerdinger. Let's talk about Heimerdinger, actually, because there's some good stuff going on with Heimerdinger. Um, so Heimerdinger is a Yordle. Well, he's a Yordle. Let's start there. He's a Yordle, and he is immortal. Like, he's immortal. Uh, he cannot die. And that leads to some interesting things about it. The first time we ever see Heimerdinger in the show is when Jace is in prison, right? Like, he's imprisoned after having his apartment robbed and, like, there's his dangerous materials are all over Zon, right? So Heimerdinger enters, and the first thing he says to Jace is, Imprisonment! What a fascinating uh, concept! The mind is free, but the body is confined, Right? Um, and that sort of tells us everything we kind of need to know about Heimerdinger right off the bat. Heimerdinger approaches imprisonment as a, a thought exercise, like as something entirely theoretical, as an entirely intellectual exercise. Like, oh, you're in prison. Well, isn't that a fascinating conundrum? I do love to think about things. Um, like, to, so to him, like, being in, imprisoned is just a, a thought experiment. Like, because to him, even if you throw him in jail for 50 years, that's nothing. Like, that really isn't anything to him. He can just, he can just sit around and think. And he's perfectly happy to do that. Because he's a Yordle. Because he's immortal. He doesn't experience time and mortality the same way that humans do. To him, as people are pointing out in chat, all human beings are essentially children. Um, like, and, and like, so throughout the entire show, Heimerdinger is constantly like, oh, that fascinating technology. We shall certainly see how that plays out in the next 150 years or so. Um, he's constantly cautioning conservatism, being careful, being slow, being measured, taking like extra precautions to make sure that technology is not misused. He's constantly telling people to be more patient, to go slower all the time. And that's because... He doesn't experience time the way humans do. When when uh, Jace and uh, and Victor unveil their hex gems, right? Um, he's like, oh, what a fascinating invention. With 10 years of research, I'm sure it will be safe. Because to him, 10 years is nothing. It's nothing. Like, he literally says that, oh, don't you worry, my boy. It'll pass you by in the blink of an eye. But for human beings, it won't. It won't pass by in the blink of an eye. For Victor, 10 years is longer than he's going to live. Right? And so human beings react to Heimerdinger's constant warnings to go slow with a kind of horror. Because, like, we can't wait that long. Human beings don't live that long. If we don't help people now, like, in 10 years, people are going to die. People are going to be dead. Like, uh, this is this is a problem now that needs to be addressed now. 
this instant, and Heimerdinger just doesn't really understand that. He exists in a different universe. He exists very much apart from the human experience, and that's why the thing that happens in Act 2 happens to him. That's why he gets ousted. It's because he gives this speech, right? He gives this very idealistic speech about, We were once one tribe. And I believe if we put aside our greed and our individual ambition, we can be so again. Like that's, um, like that's that that's his belief is that he is in his head, and to him everything is sort of an intellectual exercise, and so he doesn't see that Piltover and Zahn are progressing around him. This is also why, by the way. Um, he really hasn't done anything to fix the problems in Zaun. As Jace correctly points out, like, Zaun has been a hellhole for years, for like decades and decades, and you've been presiding over it all. Um, so, like, wh what the fuck, Heimerdinger? Why haven't you done anything? And that's because Heimerdinger just doesn't see those things as urgent. The same way that a human would. It's because he doesn't see those things as important the same way that humans would. Um... And so he has been unable, like, as a leader, he has been unable to really fix the problems of Piltover and Zaun because he has this, this perspective that, oh, it will all be fixed in time. It will all be fixed in time. Oh, pollution, well, we can clean that up in a hundred years. And, like, economic inequality, well, we'll invent something to deal with it in a hundred years. Um, and it's not that he's evil. It's not that he's cruel. It's not that he's malicious. It's just that... He exists in such a different emotional universe. He exists in such a different life experience that he just... He's just not the right person to lead a city that's full of mortals. Just really isn't. Um... And, like, that's why, like, that that's why Victor also betrays it. Like, that's why Jace betrays him and says, No, listen, old man, it's time for you to retire because, like, you can't lead the city. He's not, When Jace does that, he's not wrong. Like it's not it's not like he's not doesn't have a valid argument against Heimerdinger. It's just that you know, it's 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 very emotionally painful to do that. Um and it's why Victor eventually goes to Singed instead. Because like Victor comes to understand that Heimerdinger is like for him, oh well another another mortal is going to die. Yeah. That's happened to Heimerdinger hundreds of times already. Like to him, that's not it's literally, quite literally, not the end of the world. It's sad, and it hurts him, but Heimerdinger is not going to see that as the end of the world the same way that Victor does, or Jace. Um, yeah, in the scene with Heimerdinger and Victor, he's trying to be comforting, but he doesn't know what dying is. Like, he doesn't know. He's immortal. He can't die. Well, I mean, Yordles might be able to be killed, but he's immortal. Like, he can't, he can't empathize with Victor's experience of mortality because he isn't. Um, so like, so like Heimerdinger is quintessentially out of touch. Like, that's the thing about him. He is out of touch, very, very, very literally out of touch. Deeply out of touch. Um, no, Yordles don't die, uh, Kakat. They live forever. Yordles are functionally immortal. And so, like, and that's why Heimerdinger, like, gets ousted. That's why, like, like, that's why Heimerdinger also, like, the council is corrupt, right? Like, deeply corrupt. They are, do corrupt business dealings. They don't follow the laws. They don't care about the laws. They, they just enrich themselves. And Heimerdinger doesn't see that because, again, he lives in this intellectual universe where everything can be talked through and everything can sort of be, can sort of be, be resolved with a conversation and a debate. And the complexities of of real life are like they're a lot they're a lot more than that you know <laughs> can they die by unnatural things such as a gunshot we don't know 100% like we don't know what happens when a yordle dies like we know yordles can be like slain but we don't know that that they die like we don't know that they don't just pop back up in the spirit realm um so what we do know is that they never die of natural causes. Like, not disease and not uh, age. <laughs> but that makes Heimerdinger a really interesting character. Like, because Heimerdinger also isn't wrong. Like, when Heimerdinger says, 
Hextech technology is incredibly dangerous. Magic is incredibly dangerous. And if you're not extremely careful, then a lot of people are going to get hurt and die. And it's going to do terrible things to the world. Like, as I saw, as we talked about previously, in Act 1, we see that happen. Is that as Victor and Jace are having their triumph inventing Hextech, those Hex crystals are killing children in Zon. Like, absolutely causing the most horrifying devastation you have ever seen in your life. Um because this technology is dangerous in the wrong hands and we're going to see that uh, and we're going to see that again in act 3 with Jinx having gotten her hands on Hextech technology like uh Silco having gotten his hands on Hextech technology it's like yeah is like it is dangerous it's going to hurt people and if you're not like if you're not careful if you're not responsible with your technology if you're not taking it slow and doing tests, you're gonna get people hurt and killed. And that's one of the tensions of the show is like, is the price of progress. Um, it's the, um, it's the, and, and that's that's the, one of the themes of the show is the, it's the theme of industrialization. It's the theme of what is the cost of these scientific advancements? What What is the cost of this industrial advancement that we're getting. Like, we get all this wonderful technology, but one of the prices of all of that technology of Piltover is the pollution of Zon. Is that children are growing up on the streets, living in poison smog all their lives, right? Like, that's that's one of the that's one of the costs of it that we did in, like, um, in, like, Gaslight London anymore. But you look up e-waste on the internet. Like, you look up what happens to your computers and your phones and your electronic devices when you throw them out. Where they go and who has to deal with the waste, it's, um... Oh, shit. <laughs> Hang on. I believe I'm streaming prop... Uh... Yeah, refresh the stream if you're not, uh, if you're not seeing anything. Anyway, e-waste. Like, that's one of the big things that the Western world is dumping on the developing world, is e-waste. There are... Let me see, uh... Yeah, it's the city of Jiyu in China. It's essentially a, a city that exists entirely to process e-waste. And if you look up pictures from Jiyu in China, it's like children sitting in the middle of, of like, just piles of wires, stripping them down to get the gold out of them, and or the copper or the silver out of them. And like children like like burning, like living in the fumes of like, of uh, it's spelled, gee, basically how, how it's uh, said. Living in the fumes of like burning rubber and burning plastic that's being disposed of. And it's just being dumped on, on places like China, on uh, places like India. Uh, Nigeria has had a big problem with it. Where it's just companies paying to dump their shit there and telling those other countries to take care of it. And again, also climate change. Like, climate change is going to be bad for me. It's going to be bad for me. Like, because uh, I live in a country that's, not, like, not that far above sea level, so that's going to suck for us. But we're rich. We'll be fine. Uh, it's going to be a lot worse for some of the people who live in, like, island nations that are going to disappear. Like, that are going to be underwater. Like they're just they're just going to vanish and they're going to become refugees with no nation. Like with no government, with no nation, with with nothing to guarantee their rights. And like it's the price of industrialization. That's one of the things that the show is interested in. That's one of the things that the show is dealing with. Actually actively dealing with is questioning, like, okay, we get these wonderful scientific advancement of Piltover, but like Zon is paying for it. Like, Zonites are paying for these advancements. Like, it, the payment, like, the, the price comes in wealth inequality. It comes in pollution. It comes in, like, it, in, like, a million, billion, infinite number of little ways that affects always those who have the least to begin with. Right? And that's one of the things that the show is actually interested in talking about. Um, and... I really like that. I really like that the show is actually engaging critically with that idea that there might be, like, an unacceptable cost to progress. Like, that there might be a limit to how much it is worth progressing down the road of industrialization. That there is a limit to it. Which I think, like, that's an interesting philosophical idea to talk about. Like, that there is, like, hey, there, there does come a point, maybe, where you should kind of stop 
and instead just focus on cleaning up the mess you've already made. Um, like, that's an interesting idea. I don't really have a hot take on that one specifically, like, because I kind of believe that technological advancement is the only thing that's going to pull us out of this mess um, if we're going to get pulled out of it at all. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, but it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting concept. And it's interesting that the show is basing itself around an exploration of that of that conflict. Um, anyway, there are some super chats I think I missed. Uh, let's see. Uh, AF sent one that says, Love ya, keep the awesome interesting concept coming. You're, well, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you see more of the robots helping Victor keeping up the hex gates, by the way. Yeah, like, uh, they're around, but we still don't really know what their species is. Because I believe their robot shells are, like, they're not their true bodies. Like, they're not robot people. They, they are, there are other, something else in there, um, I think. Uh, Nos rests. Retina sent a super chat. I think they meant Act 2 Jinx. There's been speculation about how old... Oh, sexualization of, of Jinx. Jinx as a character. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't know her age, specifically. But her character design... It, like, the way her character design was created was for a character in League of Legends who was meant to be something like 24, I think. Something along those lines. And then that character design got substantially desexualized, frankly, uh, for Arcane. And now she looks like that. And I don't really have a particular hot take on... I, I don't think she's especially sexualized as such. Um, certainly the camera doesn't treat her as a sex object. Like, the camera never lingers on her body in any way that I would consider particularly sexualized. Um, so, like... Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, I think it's a valid criticism, I guess. Um, but I don't, like, at least as far as I can tell, there's not really anything there to worry about as such. Not that I can articulate, anyway. Uh, yeah, people draw porn of her. Of course they do. Like, yeah, that... I'm sorry, that, that that's just a thing that happens. Uh, that's not really a valid criticism of the character design, because, like, because, like, people do that of everything. Like, everything. So, you know, it... Mm. So, like, I, I, I wouldn't say that she's particularly sexualized. Anyway, uh, Singed and Rio, Kim Guzman. Yeah, I would talk about Singed and Rio, but there isn't, there isn't anything there. Like, there is, well, there is. Like, Singed is an interesting, important character, but he's not, he's such a background character so far. Like, very, very a background character. We got some development for him in, in terms of his relationship with, uh, Victor. Um, like, the, like, the, the, the way that he teaches Victor about, like, that sort of, sort of dispassionate, disconnected look um, on ethics and on, on like, the dignity of life compared to the necessity of progress. Like, there's, there's something there, but Singed is not really much of a character. Like, he's not really shown much development. He hasn't really had much dialogue um, at all. So, like, I don't think there's that much to talk about with Singed. As such, and the same thing with Rio. Like, uh, there's something to talk about with Rio's character design because Rio is introduced as an adorable thing, like absolutely, like with giant eyes and a big mouth, and she's such a massively, massively cute character design, just absolutely fucking adorable character design. And then you see what Singed does to her, and it's like, oh god, oh god, oh fucking hell. Oh, okay, he does bad things. Singed does bad things, and like that's. That's just a very effectively executed character design, is to take a character, make them very cute and appealing, and then just do something horrible to them um, to shock the audience. Like, that works. That works very well, and it's better that they do it to, like, a character that isn't sentient uh, than a human. So, yeah, like, it's it's very much like pu putting a cute thing in front of you and then going, like, stabbing it in the back and going, ha-ha! Like, it's shock value. It's very well executed. It's, it's, uh, it's very well executed, but it's shock value. It's fully shock value. 
And yeah, I think I agree with chat that like somewhat, it seems just, if he's going to get any development at all, it's going to happen in Act 3. Like that's when he's, if he's going to be a character, he's going to be a character there. Um, Let's see. Are, they, are you worried they're going to pull a void mind corruption with Victor rather than be his own logic that draws him into machine augmentation? Yes. Yes, I am worried about that because like the imagery of the hex core as as sort of Victor is is falling deeper and deeper into like his research the imagery of it and the imagery of the shimmer and the imagery of singed lab and like everything that has to do with all that purple shit that is so much the void like that's so much the void like it's it's so void themed it's so void coded that like I'm thinking that that seems to be what they're driving at. That that like the hex core with with Victor's blood has become connected to the void somehow, and they're gonna make him sort of a Malzahar character. And I would really rather they didn't. Like I would really rather they didn't. Um, I would really rather they didn't do that because I don't want Victor to be mind controlled. I don't want him to become who he is because of mind control. I want him to, be, to become who he is because of his own beliefs, like because of what he believes and because of what he believes is necessary and right. Like I want him to take action out of genuine conviction, not out of like void did mind control magic to him. Uh, let's see, are Silco and Marcus good character wise? Yeah, they're great characters. Like Marcus is a piece of shit. Like, Marcus is a piece of shit. He's a piece of garbage. He's a terrible person. Like, he's the worst person in the entire show. Marcus sucks, and that makes him a great character. Like, he is awful. <laughs> he's awful. What a asshole. Like, what an absolute sack of shit. Like, he's just he's just the absolute worst and excellent. Like, very good character. Um, and great characterization. Because, like, uh, yeah, he's, he also hates himself. That's true, Bruno. Like, he knows what a shit person he is. Like, he knows that he's fucked up real bad. But he can't stop. Like, he cannot stop fucking up. Um, but, yeah, no, he's terrible. He's, he's a bad, bad person. <laughs> Any bets on whether they're retconning Hextech being made of Brackern babies? Yeah, I don't think the Brackern are going to be an, uh, show up in Arcane. Like, in Arcane, at least... They are not, like, the Brackeran don't exist. The Hextech crystals were not harvested from Brackeran. They have nothing to do with the Brackeran. Um, as far as I can tell, they fully retconned it there. In the main canon? I don't know. It depends. Like, if Arcane becomes very popular, probably they'll retcon it there as well. Um, but yeah. Can't we hear a scream when they explode? Yeah, but is that, like, just magic noises? Like, yeah. Like... I don't think we hear their voices. Like, like people, like you can interpret the noise that the magic makes as sort of voices, but no, I really don't. I really don't think so. Um, I really don't. The Hextech do sound like Brackern though. How do you know what Brackern sound like? <laughs> okay, they don't sound like Skarner. <laughs> um, so no, I, I think that I think it's getting retconned. Um. Can we talk about that last line from Victor to Singed? Kind of confused. Uh, Victor says to Singed, I understand now. And what he understands is what Singed meant when he said, like, like the mutation must survive. And that's when he did those horrible things to Rio. Like, Singed is like, this was necessary for science. Like, for the scientific progress that I'm making, it was necessary that this was done to this creature. Like, that this creature suffered the way that, that it did. And Victor says to him at the end, I understand now. Like, he gets it now because he's facing down his own mortality. And, um, like, he, and he knows that he's gonna die if he doesn't do something drastic and radical to, like, to make sure that his work and himself survive. Um, that's what he understands now is, is the necessity of doing things that are maybe not nice, but in his mind necessary. Let's see. Singed doing bad to Rio is one of the moments I think was artificially pushed. Without Victor, I wouldn't have seen it as a bad thing. He just prolonged Rio's life and used bad looking language. I don't I don't really know what you mean by that, Sefbi. Artificially pushed? Everything in the story is artificial. 
It's all artificial. All of it. Everything. So I, I, I don't really know what that means. Uh, sorry. Okay, um, yeah, we're coming up on three hours, and that's about as long as I wanted this stream to be. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you have any last-minute questions, uh, get them in now. But, uh, why is the bathroom sign on? Oh, it's not, um, it's just my stream glitched. Okay, <laughs> it's not on. Um... Any thoughts on the theory that tried to hit on Victor is the firelight that kicked Caitlyn? I don't know. I don't really have any thoughts on that. Like, uh, maybe. Possibly. Uh, it, it is Sky. Like, uh, Sky is uh, someone that Victor met in the Undercity way back when. Um, but yeah. Is this going to be a VOD? Yes. Yes, it is. Don't you worry. I was wondering if the night sky during the sex scene had any meaning. Yeah, it's the cosmos. Um, like, it's... The whole thing is about, like, Victor connecting with the cosmos. Uh, connect, like, connecting with magic on a, on a like, a deeper level. In the same way that Jace, uh, Jace is connecting with Mel. Um, and so, like, it represents, like, Victor is, is experiencing a cosmic awareness. It's a transcendence, you know. How do you know that the Firefly Sky... I don't. I think it's possible, but I don't know. What would you want from a possible Arcane 2? I would want uh, it to be set in a new region. I would want it to be set in, like, uh, Shirima. Like, I would want to go somewhere completely different. Are we going to get more episodes of possibly another season? We're going to get... We're not going to get any more episodes than the next three. Like, at least there's been nothing announced and there's no reason to think so. Um, we might get another season. Like, but I will tell you, like, Arcane took six years to make. It took six years to make. So if we're getting a season two, it's not going to be anytime soon. It's absolutely not going to be anytime soon. <laughs> it's going to... It's going to be a while... Six years when the studio only had 20 people. Hiring more people will not make it go faster. Like, there, there's, a, there's a hard limit on how much just adding more resources can actually make this level of animation craft go faster. Um, Arcane's animation is incredibly complex. Like, it's, it's, it's animation and its development and its craft is incredibly expensive and incredibly complex. And they're just, like, there's a very hard limit on what you can do to speed it up. They just like it's there's just a limit to how much faster you can do it, no matter how many people you hire. Uh how much you outsource. So Yeah, nine pregnant people can't make a baby in one month. That that's the thing. Thoughts on Sevika? She rules. Her character design is awesome. I love her. She's fantastic. <laughs> Freljord for the TV Sky and Iceborne rant. I would be interested in Freljord, but, like, Freljord wouldn't be arcane. Like, if it's arcane, it should be about magic, specifically. Um, so, yeah. Riot CEO tweeted in 2019 that there would be multiple seasons of arcane. Yeah, but, like, it's the Riot CEO. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily take that for for uh <laughs> for, for for such for good money. Are you planning on playing the Ruined King game? I am playing the Ruined King game. And if you want to watch it, it's over on my second channel. Any predictions on what's going to be Noxus's role in the story? Noxus is going to be trying to take over Piltover. Like they're going to try they're Insofar as they're doing anything, like, Noxus is there for, so Mel can have a conflict of loyalties. Um, as far as I can tell, like, that's that's what they're going to be, is, like, Mel is going to have these dual loyalties to Piltover, but then also to her family and Noxus that she's going to have to get over. Like, she's going to have to reject her family's influence over her. 
um, for her character arc. That's as far as I can tell, anyway. Um, but yeah. Do you think Sevika could become a new champion? I doubt it. She could, but I doubt it. At least she's not being set up as one. Anyway, I think, uh, yeah, we're past three hours, so that's probably going to have to be it. The new episodes drop in, what, ten hours or so? Um, and we'll be watching it live over on the Discord. So if you join the Discord, there's going to be a room called Watch Party, where I'm going to be in the, the voice chat sort of giving my live reaction to things, and everybody's going to be screaming at each other in the chat, getting excited for the finale as it happens. So if you want to watch it live with me, you can do that over on the Discord. Uh, I have a Patreon, Merchandise Store, Tip Job, blah, 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 monetization, etc. I'm playing Ruined King over on my second channel, so go over there and subscribe if you want to watch that. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for listening to me go off on particular weird rants about things that aren't really related to Arcane. And uh, wear a mask, Wash your hands. Like, you should do that. You should wash your hands no matter what if there's a pandemic. But there's a pandemic, so so wash your hands especially. Uh, take whatever vaccines are necessary. Get your flu shot if you can. And try to act with solidarity towards those who are worse off than yourself.